We're going to get started. We're not quite at quorum yet, but we will be uh, soon. And so um, I do want, nonetheless want to um, keep our agenda moving here. Uh, we do have a, uh, one or two formal actions that we want to take in relative to the minutes, but we'll wait until uh, we have a quorum. Um, I am, uh, uh, and I guess I actually really can't call us to order until we have a, a, a quorum. So let me do this. Um, uh, let me just uh, do a few very uh, brief, quick uh, initial uh, uh, statements and thoughts, um, and then uh, we're going to move right into the agenda. And at whatever point we're at forum, I'll call us into a formal uh, hearing, and uh, then we'll proceed from there. So my name is Carlos Stadiani, State Representative from uh, St. Paul, and I have the uh, privilege of chairing the uh, House Committee on Education uh, Policy. And I want to thank everyone uh, for being here uh, today, for the uh, uh, community members here in the East Metro area. And also I want to thank uh, the presence of my colleagues uh, from the uh, Minnesota House. Uh, some of you have traveled a little bit of a distance to be here, so I, I greatly appreciate that. Um, a little bit later, I'm going to quickly go around and ask uh, members to introduce themselves. Uh, but I'll do that once we kind of have a, more of a critical mass here uh, with us. Uh, very quickly, uh, restrooms are off to your right. There's an immediate one right off to the right, uh, a unisex restroom. And then if you go down a little bit further and off to the right again, there's a boys and girls uh, uh, restroom. Um, I want to thank uh, the East Metro Integration District, uh, Superintendent uh, Janet Moore, who's here with us, and we'll hear from her uh, a little bit later. Uh, thank you for uh, hosting uh, as the uh, district uh, this hearing. I also want to thank the Crossman School for the physical hosting uh, of this hearing. And I want to acknowledge uh, Brian uh, Pass, who is the superintendent, who I see walking in and out, and we're going to hear a little bit from him uh, uh, as well a little bit later. And of course, thank you for the uh, parents, students, and, and staff, uh, and community members uh, that surround the Crossman School for uh, inviting us and for hosting us uh, uh, and setting up the room and making us as comfortable as possible. We look forward to hearing from a number of you uh, soon. The, um, let me just say, and I may have to repeat this a little bit later, uh, for members there is an expense reimbursement form. It's a blue form you'll find in your packet. Uh, please fill that out uh, so that we'll cover uh, the expenses for this meeting, um, including uh, our our taco bar, yeah, that, that we'll have in the, what time are we doing that? 11.45? All right, 12.30. So my staff will nudge me and uh, uh, I'll, I'll alert folks so that the top is only cold uh, once they are served. Um, so let, let me uh, uh, just very quickly uh, share uh, my interest in, in this issue and why I've, I've asked the committee to come and convene uh, at Crosswinds. As, as many of you know, uh, the whole issue of, of this particular school and the Harambe School uh, was a hot topic issue at the very end of session. It was one of the final kind of unfinished, not kind of, really was an unfinished uh, bit of business uh, that uh, we didn't get to at the end of session. Uh, it created quite a bit of heartburn um, and concern. And, and so um, I thought that it was critically important for us not to let that conversation just sort of filter away because it'll come back next session. Um, and also because this community is continuing to uh, discuss uh, the decisions surrounding both this school, uh, but more importantly members, or just importantly I should say, um, um, the discussion um, is one that has to do with the future of integration, uh, the integration revenue program, the integration uh, uh, <coughs> approach that the state um, has invested in uh, well over uh, a couple of decades here. Um, and so I thought it was, oh, I thought it was really important for us then to, and then is this on? Do I need to switch it on? That helps, good. Should I start over? Yeah. <laughs> Um, and so I thought, uh, let's begin that conversation. We'll continue to have this conversation throughout the uh, interim and into the, the next session as well. 
Uh, but what uh, I can't think of a better place to have that conversation than out here uh, in the community. And uh, members, um, I, I'm, I'm thinking and I'm hoping that we may be able to extend that conversation out into your communities as well. So let me know if that's uh, of interest uh, to, to you as, as legislators from, from those communities. So um, uh, the order of the agenda today then is to uh, begin with just sort of a, a, a quick uh, staff presentation of just sort of just the facts, uh, the explicit uh, um, facts that have led to uh, both uh, this building and our approach to, in general, to the Integration Revenue Program. Uh, what were the latest um, uh, attempts uh, this last legislative session to legislate around this? Uh, then we'll, we're going to hear um, uh, a broader uh, message uh, around the uh, compelling state interest that, we, that has been articulated and acted upon by the state over the last uh, couple of years. And so what I'm trying to do is make sure that we set a really good context here of what are the uh, factual um, um, uh, decisions that have led to this magnet school uh, uh, delivery uh, of integration efforts, as well as to have a quick conversation about uh, what the public policy uh, uh, considerations are for that. In other words, what is the compelling state interest um, that uh, has driven the state of Minnesota to invest uh, uh, its time and resources uh, in K-12 uh, uh, integration efforts? And then we want to hear from uh, the community here at Crosswinds uh, to talk about uh, how you've manifested uh, that compelling state interest in delivering an education uh, experience and whether that's been good, whether that's been bad, what are the lessons uh, that we draw from that, uh, what are the suggestions that it may mean, that it may offer in terms of, 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 of future uh, work uh, for integration. Um, and, and of course, uh, the new context there is that this year the legislature uh, redesigned the integration program and did a very aggressive, uh, assertive move toward um, uh, combining uh, strong expectations of both uh, racial integration and academic achievement um, as uh, necessary uh, outcomes of the state's investment in this program. And then we're going to uh, finish by hearing from the EMED um, uh, governance structure, their thoughts along the same lines. So with that, I think I am now going to say I, I did a good stalling job. I think I am going to uh, ask our, our members to introduce themselves. And so uh, very quickly, you just tell us who you are and the community uh, you, you represent. And um, we have more folks coming in. So I'll start with uh, Representative Keel. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Um, yes, I'm Representative Keel. I'm from District 1B, and I uh, hail from uh, the North Dakota side, right uh, south of the Canadian border, a little ways, about 80 miles south. And Representative Keel and, and members, uh, uh, unless we get a golfer to run this around, <laughs> the, the microphone, we're, we're going to have to really project, I guess. Uh, is that correct, folks back there? Okay, very well. So she said she's from North Dakota. That is actually what she said. She's bringing the oil money with her. Yes. Actually, that if you if you would uh, help us with that, Eric, that we want. Okay. Sure. Why not? Clarify. Round two. Clarify that you're not in North Dakota. Okay, I will do that. <laughs> Hi, I'm um, Deb Keel. I'm from District 1B, which is uh, um, just south of the Canadian border um, and on the North Dakota border is what I said. <laughs> but I am east of North Dakota, if this is correct. <laughs> I represent um, Polk, Red Lake, and most of Pennington counties. So, thank you. I'll just go ahead. Uh, I'm Representative Krisha, and uh, the district I represent is Central Minnesota 9B, Morrison and Todd County, Little Falls. Uh, if you've been through Royalton, you know where Treasure City is, that's my area. Uh, my background is education. I've been in and out of education. I also started an online learning company, and then from there I've started an economic development. So I'm very familiar with many of the, the issues that you folks see in education. 
I'm Representative David Bly from Northfield, Minnesota, and I uh, am a retired 30-year veteran teacher. Uh, my name is Ado Shuni. I am DFL Research Consultant in the House for Education. I'm Tim Strom. I'm a staff person with House Research. Jody Withers, Research for Republican Caucus. Sandra Erickson, and I represent East Central Minnesota, so when you travel to Lake Mille Lacs, you're traveling right through the heart of my district. I, I too, am a retired high school English teacher. I'm Jim Mullen, I'm a committee legislative assistant for the Education Policy Committee. So you'll hear from me again in a few minutes. Shannon Patrick, committee administrator. I'm Kathy Breiner, and I represent Mankato in the House, and I was a school board member for 12 years before I was a legislator, so I've spent a lot of time in schools, and issues of diversity are very near and dear to my heart and my community, so I look forward to the day. Lisa Larson, House Research Staff. Representative Peter Fisher represents communities of Maplewood, uh, Oak, parts of uh, White Bear Lake, Birchwood, Monomedi, and Willardy. Harambee is my district. Uh, my background a little bit, I currently work at a homeless youth sh shelter in North Minneapolis serving youth between the ages of 16 to 21. So I see a lot of diversity issues on a regular basis. I'm Representative Jim Dabney. I represent part of uh, South Minneapolis in the Minnesota House and spent 17 years teaching middle school social studies. And I'm Representative Anna Wills and I live in Apple Valley and represent Northern Apple Valley, Rosemount, and Coates. Uh, I'm Representative Dean Erdahl, uh, represent uh, 18A, which is um, Meeker County, one township in Red County, and uh, three townships in McLeod, including the city of Hutchinson. Uh, if you've gone to see the largest ball of twine made by one man in Darwin, <laughs> you're in my district. And uh, I was a uh, high school, middle school teacher for 35 years at New London Spicer. Um, currently co-chair of Secretary Ritchie, the Minnesota Civil War Commemoration Task Force, which brought me to Gettysburg last week, which led to Poison Ivy. <laughs> Stay away. I'm Barbie Russo. I represent Arden Hills, Moundsview, Shoreview, and a small part of Spring Lake Park. I'm a retired high school science teacher and an engineer, and I uh, do tutoring. I'm Mary Swatsky and I represent 17B, which is KDY County, and I reside in Wilmer. And I am presently a special education teacher at the Wilmer Middle School, 6th, 7th, and 8th grade students, where we have a high population of Somali students and uh, Hispanic, Latino. And I drove through the ball of twine today to get here in the rain, and then GPS is very interesting to get here. Uh, but uh, and not poison ivy, but I received triggers over the Fourth of July weekend. So <laughs> why don't we pass that bike back this way? Hello, uh, Representative uh, Jason Isaacson. I represent uh, Shoreview, Roseville, Little Canada, and uh, I once again have trusted the Google Maps incorrectly. So I apologize. <laughs> It got me to the other side of this park right here. So, uh, very glad to be here. I am ailment free and uh, excited to have this meeting. So, thank you all members. And as I said earlier, um, in your package you'll find the uh, blue reimbursement form. Make sure you fill that out and get that into our staff uh, so that we can make sure that we're covering the expenses, uh, both your expenses and the committee expenses uh, for this meeting. Um, Representative Erickson, I wonder if you would be so kind as to move our minutes of, I guess we had two sets of minutes, or yeah, two sets of minutes, March 14th and March 21st. Mr. Chair, I'll move the minutes of March 14th and note that there are some technical corrections, uh, interestingly to my name. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so glad I read through them. <laughs> and uh, represent, so Representative Erickson moves adoption of the March 14th and 21st? No, I just did yeah, one at a time. All right, the 14th, and can you tell us where you're doing the corrections? All right. 
Oh, they're just on spellings of my name. It's uh, kind of interesting. So Ooh. sometimes I'm uh, S A O, and then I'm Sandra at other times. And I, 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 I think our my dear friend here knows how to spell my name. So. This is a common Minnesota thing. You know, <laughs> O's, A's, and E's. Uh, I think that's something to do with our Nordic uh, uh, back, background. We'll we'll make those corrections. And so, uh, members, uh, all in favor of uh, the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion prevails. Representative Erickson. Mr. Chair, I'll move the uh, minutes of March 21st. Representative Erickson moves the minutes of March 21st, and I trust that your name is correctly uh, yes. spelled. Wonderful. Um, all, <laughs> all in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion prevails. Thank you, Representative Erickson. All right, um, we're a little bit behind, but I think we're going to uh, catch up uh, fairly well. And so our first, um, our first uh, uh, presentation is to hear from uh, House Research, uh, Lisa Larson. And Ms. Larson, I also think you have uh, some uh, documents uh, to reference uh, members to as you go through your presentation. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, my colleague, Ken Strom, I suspect will have some thoughts. To, to add to this. Um, the the uh, point of this presentation is to uh, talk very briefly about about the uh, process to, uh, that the constitutional process to change the owner or the use of state bond finance property since the Crosswind Schools is a state bond finance property. The state can and has used state debt capacity to fund programs that are of regional and statewide significance. The following is meant to provide some context for the state's interest in the Crosswind School and in Metropolitan Magnet School grants generally. During the 1990s, and at other times too, school desegregation and integration proponents have asserted the following. The Minnesota Constitution requires the state to provide an adequate education to all children. Children have a fundamental right to an adequate education. The state violates its duty and children's fundamental right to receive an adequate education where segregation based on race and socioeconomic status is permitted. And a segregated education is not an equal education and therefore not an adequate education. Prior bond appropriations for Metropolitan Magnet School grants to group of qualified Metropolitan School Districts have appeared, for example, in Laws 1998, 3.8 million, Laws 1999, 1.3 million, Laws 2000, 16 million, Laws 2001, 1.7 million, and Laws 2005, 1.083 million. Representative Winkler's bill, House File 592, and I believe you have a summary that Tim prepared as well as the bill in your packet, proposing to transfer the Crosswind School to the Perfect Center for Arts Education was sent to the Capital Investment Committee precisely because the Crosswind School is a state bond finance property. Deb Dyson, Committee Counsel, presented the following information on transferring the ownership or changing the use of state bond finance property to the 2013 House Capital Investment Committee. The Crosswind School is a state bond finance property. The diagram that's on the screen, I hope somewhere. Uh, okay. Okay, up against the lockers. Yeah. The, the, um, the diagram on the screen illustrates the process I'm about to line, uh, to uh, outline in a rather cursory fashion. Unlike state authority to lease property, to transfer ownership or to change the use of a state bond finance property, the property either, one, must be determined to no longer be state bond finance property, or two, the legislature must authorize a change in ownership or in use. In the same way, that the legislature appropriates bond proceeds. And I think you can see it uh, illustrated at the top of the diagram there. By a three-fifths vote of each body and with a bill originating in the House. To determine that a property is no longer a state bond finance property, one of two things must happen. Either 
the state agency to which the bonds were appropriated, MDE in this case, must de determine that the property is no longer needed for the purpose for which the bonds were appropriated and then sell the property at fair market value. Or if the property, including any improvements made with state general obligation bonds, is older than 125% of the estimated useful life of the improved property, the property owner can work with the affected state agency, Minnesota Management and Budget, and the Minnesota Attorney General to remove the designation of state bond finance property. As an example, when the libraries in Hennepin County and Minneapolis were merged, the original appropriation to Minneapolis for the planetarium had to be amended to instead make the county the grantee. Minneapolis could not simply give the planetarium to Hennepin County as part of the merger. Whether bond proceeds used for acquiring and improving property have been repaid is not relevant to determining that a property is no longer a state bond finance property. A property is no longer a state bond finance property only if the affected state agency determines that the property is no longer needed for its intended purpose and then sells it at fair market value, or the improved property is older than 125% of its estimated useful life and the affected state agency, MMB, and the AG work to remove the designation. And I hope that this explanation is made clear by the diagram. It's a kind of flow chart, and you can see there are really two uh, options here. These limitations ensure that the intent of the Constitution is followed. The Constitution requires specificity with respect to the name of the entity and the purpose or statutory program for which the bond proceeds are, or, are authorized. The recipient of the bond proceeds appropriation is not simply a fiscal agent. It cannot, under the Constitution, transfer the appropriation to an ineligible entity, use it for an ineligible purpose as a way around the constitutional limits on use of state debt, or transfer it to an entity, or use it for a purpose the legislature did not authorize. The question in these cases is always whether the substance of the desired transaction was contemplated in what the legislature enacted. If there is any doubt, and the standard of bound counsel is very high, then the provision has to be amended, either directly or by specific reference, and passed in the same way as bond proceeds appropriations, a three-fifths vote in each house and a bill originating in the house. It can be argued that this constitutional process shows the significance the legislature attached to magnet school grants and to the Crosswind School. Thank you, Ms. Larson. And um, let me say, we don't have this particular schematic in your packets, uh, but we will make this uh, available and we'll also make it available for the public by making sure that it's part of uh, what will what, get posted on our website. Um, uh, so for those of you in the audience, um, uh, a good practice is to go on the Minnesota House uh, Representative web website. If you go on to the different committees, there's a committee page, um, and on those pages you can find the minutes of meetings as well as uh, most documents that are shared uh, at, at, those minutes, uh, at those meetings. rather. And so uh, we'll be sure to, uh, to post this schematic uh, uh, there for you. Uh, the intent here wasn't to spend a whole lot of time on this particular uh, issue. However, we are also joined by uh, our other house research uh, staff person, Tim Strom, who, um, um, has, uh, 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 who has served with us for quite a while, enough so that uh, he has some history with um, the, uh, the uh, decisions relative to this particular property as well as uh, uh, ongoing integration uh, revenue uh, designs. And so at this point, I'll pause very quickly to see if there are any uh, comments uh, from uh, committee members, and then I'm going to move on to our next uh, testifier. Before I do that, I do want to acknowledge uh, Representative Ryan Winkler uh, has joined us. And uh, Representative Winkler, your um, uh, community you represent is all encompassed within uh, um, uh, St. Louis uh, Park, is that correct? All right, St. Louis Park, Golden Valley. A little bit of fun. Right. 
and part of Plymouth. So welcome. Thank you for being with us here today. Uh, members, any questions or rather any thoughts? Uh, we're, we're, we don't really want to um, 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 spend a whole lot of time with questions on this particular issue, but if there's anything of, of interest that you want to uh, share, that anything that, that got triggered here uh, for you, please. All right, very well. Um, and if, if that gets triggered later, uh, then we'll uh, pick up your, your thoughts and questions at that point. Uh, so now I'm going to ask uh, rep or, <laughs> former Representative Myron Orfield, uh, who is a professor of law at the University of Minnesota and a director of the uh, Institute on Metropolitan Opportunity, uh, to come forward and share uh, his testimony with us uh, in terms of the, the issue of compelling state interest relative to the Integration Revenue Program, uh, of course of which um, uh, with, within that um, uh, compelling state interest, this particular building uh, was established as a, a regional magnet school. And so, uh, Mr. Orfield, if you can come forward, it'd be wonderful. And I think there's a, yeah, that mic um, should be there for you. Thank you. Can everybody hear me pretty well? Probably if you hold it closer. How about now? Can everybody hear me now? Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, I'm a law professor, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the law uh, it relates to integration and then a little bit about uh, some of the demographics of the region and, and some of the situations in the metropolitan area, the growing racial segregation in the city schools, and in most of the schools of the fully developed suburbs. Uh, I think for a long time people have thought of racial segregation as just simply an urban issue. Uh, the most rapid increase in racial segregation is now in the suburbs of the Twin Cities. And uh, they are changing at almost twice the rate the central cities became segregated. So I'll talk a little bit about that and uh, with a little bit of uh, some maps and some charts. Uh, it's interesting that uh, uh, um, Representative Erdahl was just at Gettysburg. Uh, you know, the, it, Minnesota's interest in uh, integration really goes back to the Civil War. Minnesota was a very fiercely abolitionist state, and after the 14th Amendment was passed, we were the second state in the Union to forbid uh, racial segregation in schools. We did it by statute in 1869. The Iowa Supreme Court declared segregation unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. We did it by the legislature, or Republican legislature, forbid racial segregation in our schools, and also withheld funds to schools that practice segregation. We were the first state in the country to do that. And uh, never really, it became a very big issue when the Congress passed Title VI of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. And if you look at the legislative testimony surrounding that, people hearken back to Minnesota pioneering that practice. Um, in 1896, the Supreme Court uh, allowed segregated schools, saying separate but equal was all right, in Plessy versus Ferguson. In 1954, uh, the Supreme Court overruled that decision in May of 1954, saying that racially segregated schools, intentionally racially segregated schools, were inherently unequal. Uh, that they dramatically decreased the educational uh, 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 access of non-white students, uh, that they affected their part ability to participate in the political process uh, in the armed forces, uh, and that they were inherently unequal. The Supreme Court said in Brown versus Board of Education, racially segregated schools are inherently unequal, and they are likely to affect the hearts and minds of children in ways that will never be undone. Um, after this, uh, these cases were fairly clear in the South where you had racially segregated statutes, uh, Jim Crow segregation. Trying to find out what constituted de jure segregation in the North uh, took a little while. It really wasn't until the early 70s in a case called Keyes versus Denver School District, the Supreme Court outlined what de jure segregation meant. And uh, the Supreme Court in Keyes and later in the Dayton case uh, Dayton uh, versus Brinkman and Columbus versus Pennock, the Supreme Court outlined a certain number of behaviors uh, that constituted intentional racial segregation. The gerrymandering of school district boundaries, so the drawing of school boundaries in ways that created racial segregation could give rise uh, to a presumption of racial segregation. Transfer policies that allow white children to avoid racially integrated schools disproportionately and go to whiter schools. This was uh, evidence of intentional racial segregation. 
um, segregated faculties, all the non-white teachers teaching in certain schools and the schools where white children were being uh, dominated by all white teachers. This could uh, amount to intentional racial segregation. In Swan uh, versus Charlotte Mecklenburg, the Supreme Court said the disproportionate building of affordable housing, housing discrimination, could constitute de jure school segregation. So that if a governmental entity was building uh, disproportionately affordable housing, government subsidized affordable housing in ways that promoted segregation. If it was constructing new schools at edge, in edge districts, in white districts at the edge of metropolitan areas, this too could give rise to an inference of intentional racial segregation. So um, interestingly enough, in Minnesota, there was a case called Booker versus Minneapolis School District. In that case, Minneapolis was found guilty of intentional racial segregation. And uh, that case is a close one to, at home to me. It involved my high school, Washburn High School, right before I was going to attend Washburn High School. Washburn High School had drawn a boundary uh, and had added an addition. And Washburn High School, right before I went to high school, was about 98% white and was considered the best high school in the city. And the, the federal court found that the drawing of that boundary around my high school constituted intentional racial segregation. And uh, the court ordered Minneapolis to be desegregated by law. So because of the federal district court in Booker versus Minneapolis, Minneapolis School District number one, I had the great privilege of going to racially integrated schools. I probably wouldn't have otherwise. And it really was a wonderful experience for me. It changed my life in lots of ways. But those are the kinds of conduct, that's the kind of conduct that can give rise to this. Now, in the absence of de jure segregation, the question is, what can, uh, local, what can school districts do to integrate schools? Uh, in Swan, uh, the court said almost anything, uh, th that this is a good thing, that we believe in integration, almost anything. In the case of parents involved versus uh, um, Seattle School District number one, decided in 2007, the court was more circumspect on what local school districts could do to integrate schools. The court held that there is a compelling governmental interest in racial integration. Justice Kennedy, speaking for himself and four other members of the court, said that there is a compelling interest in integration. It's a very important interest, uh, citing back to Brown in those cases. He recently said this again in Fisher versus Texas. This last week, Justice Kennedy again said racial integration is a compelling governmental interest. Justice Kennedy also said the avoidance of racial isolation is a compelling governmental interest. So uh, these are things that school districts have a lot of leeway. School districts and states have a lot of leeway if they want to integrate kids. Now, parents involved said that uh, the, the local school districts or states couldn't create programs where one child was denied admission and one child was accepted uh, in, in admission on solely on the basis of race. That was outlawed. Prior to parents involved, a lot, of that, a lot of school districts read the Swan case and believed that that was permissible. That's no longer permissible. Parents involved, however, said that states and local governments can draw boundaries uh, to be racially integrated. They can design uh, transfer programs that don't discriminate on an individual basis, that don't deny uh, student admission solely on the basis of race or cause admission solely on the basis of race. Although race can be used as one of many factors in admission to a selective magnet program. It can't be used as the sole race of the basis. Uh, states and local school districts can use incentives to try to encourage integration. They can use programs and special funds to do those things. So a lot, almost, all the, almost all the old tools that uh, places had used um, to integrate are still available except uh, decisions where one, an individual student is accepted or denied solely on the basis of race. So these are the, the kind of the broad uh, factors uh, of legal analysis. I'm just going to show a few slides showing uh, the rapid increase in racial segregation in the metropolitan area. The Twin Cities um, was, a, the home, was the home to many very important civil rights leaders, uh, both non-white and non-white. Roy Wilkins uh, was from the Twin Cities. The auditorium is named after him. Um, Hubert Humphrey was the uh, author of the uh, principal sponsor of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, the vice president. Um, Elmer L. Anderson was a very, uh, very powerful civil rights Republican leader. Uh, Harold Stassen as well. <coughs> Minnesota passed the first human rights law under Republican leadership uh, in the 1950s. So it was a bipartisan. Every one of the Republican and Democratic members voted for all the civil rights bills in the 1960s. So it was a bipartisan thing. And Minnesota had a very strong commitment to 
both integrated schools and integrated housing up through the early 90s. The Minnesota didn't have a single racially segregated school until the early 1990s, and people uh, often looked at us and thought this was very strange that Minnesota must be more like Sweden or Canada than the rest of the United States. We were the last major metropolitan area that didn't have a single racially segregated school. It, in 1993, we only had six. Uh, last year, we had 135 racially segregated schools that are more than 80% non-white and poor. And we are gaining racially segregated elementary schools faster than any place in the country. We haven't reached the national average yet. We're about two-thirds of the way to the national average. If we were average in the, in the nation, we would have about another uh, 70 or 80. We're quickly going to achieve that, though. We're quickly coming up to the average. We used to have sort of a utopian system if you thought racial integration was a good thing. We're now rapidly catching up to the rest of the country. Here's a map that shows the Twin Cities metropolitan area. And each of these elementary schools, each of these dots is an elementary school. This is 2009. It's a little bit outdated. Every red school uh, has more than 80% non-white students. The orange schools are 50 to 80. Uh, light orange are 33 to 49. Uh, light blue are 20 to 33. And the dark blue are the whitest. Now, this is a little bit hard to see. Uh, I'm going to get some better maps in a second. But you can see that the central city is dominated. Both central cities are dominated by schools that are uh, in those top two categories. And uh, most of the segregated schools as of 2009 were in the central cities, although about 35% uh, of them were in the first string suburbs. This is in 2009. This is poverty. And poverty and race often are tied together. Uh, white poor children, by and large, in this metropolitan area and throughout the country go to middle-income schools. Uh, Non-white poor children, particularly black and Latino poor children, go to overwhelmingly poor schools. And uh, this is because of persistent residential discrimination in the housing market. Uh, because of uh, steering practices like steering, the way that real estate agents and rental agents treat non-white households uh, and home buyers. Mortgage lending discrimination uh, forms a big part of this. We have the largest disparity in mortgage lending discrimination in the United States. A black family that earns $157,000 in this metropolitan area is less likely to qualify for a prime loan than a white family that earns $40,000. Uh, a, a, a disproportionate uh, placement of affordable housing in, within the boundaries of segregated or integrated school attendance areas, exclusionary zoning, a variety of other issues, consistent discrimination. Uh, against non-white citizens. So you can see the uh, poverty and race tie together. When children go to high poverty schools, the, uh, ev the evidence uh, about educational effects is really powerfully clear. High poverty schools powerfully depress graduation rates. Uh, the Supreme Court recently, uh, in the two parents involved case, heard uh, testimony from over 2,000, it was received briefs from over 2,000 scholars on the subject of integration. And uh, there were three briefs that talked about the benefits of integration, two briefs that disputed those benefits, but no one disputed the fact that going to, uh, to economically integrated schools is very important in terms of graduation rate, in terms of college attendance, in terms of later uh, earnings, uh, having a decent job, a middle class job. These were all powerfully related to going to middle income schools, racially integrated schools. Test scores, uh, the experts did dispute how much test scores were affected by integration. Um, this is a map that shows the change in the percentage of minority students. And the red schools are changing more than 25 points. And you can see that most of the big change is going on in the first string suburbs. Most of the places that are becoming racially diverse are in the first string suburbs. That's also true about becoming socially diverse. Uh, more than half of uh, non-white families now live in the suburbs. If you look at uh, non-white families that earn above the median income, 60% live in the suburbs. If you look at non-white married families with children, 75% live in the suburbs. Now, as non-white married families with children move to the suburbs, they are treated very differently in the housing market than white families of similar education, income, and credit history. Uh, Non-white families are often shown parts of the suburbs where the schools are racially diverse. White families of the similar education, income, and credit history are often shown much whiter suburban areas where the schools are much whiter. Uh, this is called steering, and it's a very common practice. Uh, the superintendents of many of the suburban school districts have talked about this. The superintendents of Robbinsdale, of Richfield, of uh, St. Louis Park, of uh, Roseville, 
uh, South St. Paul and West St. Paul have always talked have talked consistently about this kind of a, a practice. Um, anyway, this is this often leads to growing segregation. These are test scores, and you can see that the high poverty schools have the lowest test scores on the MCA twos. Poverty is the strongest correlate to test scores. This is another thing that young middle class families look at when they are buying houses. They look at the test scores of the local school districts. The test scores are often, uh, you know, represent they're clear representations of poverty. Poverty is the highest correlate to test scores. But when families are buying houses, they see the low test scores. They decide not to buy there, and it has an effect on continuing the process of disinvestment. And this is a lot of times happening in the first string suburbs. So the first one was math, the second one was reading. You can see they're very similar. Graduation rates. Uh, in the high poverty schools and the high schools of the cities in the older suburbs, graduation rates are much depressed uh, on all measures and by whoever is keeping track of this. Uh, this is the grad test. Um, these are dropout rates. And you can see the high schools red and orange have the highest dropout rates. Uh, these are four-year attendance rates. They're just different ways to calculate dropouts. Um, I'm talking about Minneapolis. Minneapolis has really changed fast. Minneapolis has become the, the has gone from about 52,000 students uh, at its peak, recent peak in the early 90s. Last year, 31,000 students. Really dramatic loss of students. I'm going to show you a time series of the Minneapolis schools, and you can see in 1995 they were relatively integrated. You'll see over time, the schools southwest of Lake Harriet will become almost all white. The schools in the near south of Minneapolis will become almost all Latino. The schools in the north side will become almost all black. And you'll see a dramatic loss of population uh, from the near south side and the near north side. You'll see the white areas of the city uh, very full with schools expanded. So this is 95 to 96, 7. You can see the pattern. And you'll see, again, the, the, little, the blue uh, is white. Yellow is Latino, red is black, uh, or orange is Asian Pacific Islander. You can see, you'll start to see fast changes now. You can see the school <laughs> south of Lake Harriet, the blue little Pac-Men are closing, and it, it shows they're becoming whiter. Um, and you'll see the school's disappearing fast. Um, by 2010 to 2011, the white schools in the southwest quadrant of Minneapolis, Lake Harriet School, uh, was rated among the three or four highest scoring schools in the state. It had the state chess championship team. Uh, it had a pathway toward Southwest High School, which was a pathway to the best colleges in the country. A few miles away, you had schools where the, the strongest career pathway was prison, and the, the, particularly among young men in the most segregated schools. In the same school district, a few miles away, uh, some kids were on the way to Yale, and on the other side of the city, some kids were on the way to jail. And it was the same school system, the same curriculum, the same basic things. The, the difference was the racial segregation and, the, and those challenges. Um, you'll see free lunch. As the white kids disappear from the, middle in, from the racially integrated schools, you'll see the middle class kids disappear. As the kids of color disappear from the white schools south of Lake Harriet, scoring among the highest in the state, you'll see the poor kids disappear. So Minneapolis is uh, coming back to what it was before uh, the, the case. Well, here's those test scores, and you can, these are the MCA tests. You'll see Lake Harriet and, and uh, Burroughs School among the highest scoring elementary schools in the state. And you'll see a few miles away some of the lowest scoring schools. Uh, residential segregation has greatly intensified in the Twin Cities. We used to be a place, again, like our schools. We didn't really have segregated schools. We really didn't have segregated neighborhoods. Um, these are the uh, patterns of segregation in 1980. You see 1990, uh, 2000, and 2000. Um, this is a, a, a map that shows predominantly non-white neighborhoods in 1990. Those are red. The areas that are uh, green are racially integrated between 20 and 60%. So this is 1990. This is 2000. So you see uh, the areas of predominantly non-white status growing, racial isolation. You'll see integrated areas growing involving many of the suburbs. Uh, this is 2005 to 2009. You see big parts of the suburbs are becoming integrated. And this is 2010, um, where you see a pattern of lots of the suburbs becoming racially integrated. Um, I'm going to skip up ahead with uh, St. Paul and get to some of the suburbs so I don't take too much time. You get a former legislator who's a law professor. It's hard to keep him quiet. Um, 
This is, the, this is Osseo in the northern suburbs. This is a path that the black families are moving to, particularly black middle income families. And I'm gonna show you the same time series about the schools that are changing there. This is 95, and you'll see really the rapid racial change in, in the Osseo school district. So uh, Osseo is, is divided from east to west. It's, uh, the west side is becoming more integrated. The east side is majority non-white. All the same things have happened in that school area with low test scores and low attainment. They're doing better than the schools in North Minneapolis, but not having the same access that they used to. Um, poverty, again, follows suit. Uh, test scores, again. I'm going to look at the south. This is Ridgefield and Bloomington. You can see this movement. Richfield is a majority non-white school system. It's almost 80% non-white last year and poor. Um, Bloomington is uh, mostly non-white on the east side. Uh, the west side is more integrated. Um, poverty follows suit. Um, and test scores. This is the northwest suburbs. Here's Roseville and uh, North St. Paul, Maplewood, White Bear. You can see the trends changing there. Oops, this is the most recent year. And poverty. I just have one more set of slides and then I'll slow down. This is uh, South St. Paul, West St. Paul. And um, you can see the changes there. Now, I think one of the things that people talk, think of it is that uh, segregation in schools is about choices. And there's very little evidence to say that racially segregated schools are the choices of non-white families. All of the data uh, suggesting preferences suggest a very strong preference for integrated schools among non-white families and students. Um, there's a lot of uh, dis housing discrimination that is involved. There's certainly steering at very high levels, mortgage lending discrimination. We place most of our affordable housing in ways uh, that intensifies racial segregation. These are very clear goals. We also know that kids, uh, particularly non-white kids, are doing the best in the, in the Twin Cities in racially integrated schools, particularly black children. And the racially integrated schools of the western suburbs are scoring the highest, uh, uh, highest uh, scores on their test scores, are achieving access to college at the highest rates. We are beginning to see in the poorest schools very strong pathways uh, to incarceration. Uh, the, we, the Institute of Race and Poverty is now the Institute of Metropolitan Area, uh, uh, Institute of Metropolitan Opportunity has been taking a look at the children in prison and finding, uh, trying to understand the relationship of high schools to prison, and uh, they're very powerful. And peer groups are very powerful in this. Um, so to bring us full circle, the Supreme Court in Brown said that racially, racially segregated schools were inherently unequal. And they said that was the case because they offered unequal educational and economic opportunities. That's certainly true in the Twin Cities. Uh, racially segregated schools are unequal and they offer un inherently unequal access to education, higher education and opportunities. They're growing very fast. Um, given, the, given the standards of discrimination, given the ideas that school boundaries and that racially uh, segregative transfer programs may constitute uh, intentional racial segregation still, uh, we have a lot of uh, questions that we should be asking. If we have an open enrollment system that predominantly allows white children to leave racially integrated settings to go to whiter settings, is this something that the Supreme Court has uh, declared uh, questionable in Keyes, Dayton, and Columbus? Uh, we have now a, a great growth of uh, racially segregated charter schools. These, these charter schools are exempted from Minnesota Rule 3535. It's one of the only places in the country where charter schools are specifically exempted from civil rights rules. An uh, increasing percentage of them are single race. The Supreme Court in Swan said that when there are a disproportionate number of single race schools that are publicly sponsored, this creates a presumption of intentional racial segregation. We've had boundary controversies in a number of our school districts. Eden Prairie recently drew integrated boundaries, but many school districts have drawn segregated boundaries. Bloomington drew boundaries that had segregated impact just last year. Um, the East Carver County School District has drawn school boundaries that have had segregative impact. Uh, the Washington County School District has drawn boundaries that have seg segregative impact. Minneapolis School District has drawn boundaries that have segregative impact. These are questions, I think, that bear examination. Um, but uh, nevertheless, I think the evidence is clear that uh, racially integrated schools are good for kids of color. They're good for white kids. 
Uh, they're good for all kids. They help uh, sponsor uh, a sense of uh, diversity and help us understand uh, our, our future. One of the things that Justice Kennedy noted in, in, in the Fisher case and that Justice O'Connor did in the Grutter and Gratz case is that diversity is also a compelling governmental interest and that going to diverse schools not only enriches the experience of non-white kids but prepares white children for the racially diverse country and the, and the racially diverse world that we are approaching. Last year in May, on the, on the anniversary of Brown, the New York Times announced that the majority of the children born that day and henceforth were non-white in the United States. And so we crossed that threshold. We are a multiracial society, whether we like it or not. And we have uh, uh, the option of whether we are going to uh, move into our future together in a multiracial way, or whether we're going to move into our future separately uh, with uh, racially separate schools and economically separate schools. I think these are the challenges. So uh, I'm, I apologize for talking too long, uh, and I'd be happy to answer questions or go over the cases. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Um, um, I want to say Myra, but I'm Mr. Orfield. <laughs> um, I was struck by the, uh, the uh, Brown uh, quote and the uh, Supreme Court decision um, about the, uh, the effect on the hearts and minds of children that, that are difficult to, to undo. Um, and I'm particularly struck by um, how perhaps even more relevant that is in a society that, that's even more multiracially diverse than in, in the 1950s. Um, I think we do have a couple of questions. Uh, let me just ask one very quickly. Um, why isn't this just about poverty then? Uh, I mean, I, I know you made a long you know, argument here, but as you go through the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the progression of, of impacts of schools, um, obviously there's a huge poverty <coughs> poverty um, correlate here, why isn't it just about poverty? Well, I think that one of the reasons that, it, that it's not just about poverty and, uh, is that uh, by and large, poor white children, although this is beginning to change, by and large, poor white children have access to middle income schools. So if you look at where poor white children live in this region or in the United States, about three quarters of poor white children attend schools in schools that are more than 70% middle class kids. Three quarters of poor black and Latino kids attend schools that are more than 70% poor. That's true in this metropolitan area, that's true across the country. And one of the things, if you're white, you're able to uh, find the nooks and crannies of affordable housing in good school districts, and you're allowed to live there. Rental agents allow you to live there, you're not steered away from them by real estate agents. You, will, are allowed, you have social networks that help you locate that kind of housing, uh, connections and relatives, so you live in that kind of housing, and poor non-white kids don't have access to that kind of housing, and increasingly that housing is getting harder to find. And if you go to overwhelmingly poor schools, uh, whether they're all white or all minority, they still have, they have very bad effects on kids. So there are some overwhelmingly poor all white schools in Appalachia and in a few parts of the West Hill. These schools are associated with really strong increases in dropping out. These schools are associated with little connection to college or higher education. There's not very many all white poor schools in the country, there are a few and where they exist, they have the same detrimental effects on kids. So in some ways, we're talking about poverty, but because of race and because of racial discrimination, poor uh, white children have more access to middle-income schools. Uh, that being said, um, economic segregation is now on the rise, and the last census shows that uh, we're starting to see discrimination on the basis of economics in this country we never have been, we never have before. And so, while uh, poor white children have access to these schools now, they may not in the future. I'm going to uh, ask uh, Representative Verdal uh, to pose this question, and then I'll call on Representative uh, Isaacson and Representative Bly. So, um, we have to quickly pass this mic. Now, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, Representative Warfield. Once a representative, always a representative. Sure. <laughs> um, you, you mentioned the open enrollment and you know, white students transferring, right. uh, using that. Uh, I'm just wondering, is there much, open, how does open enrollment affect uh, you know, students of color? Is they, uh, do they use it as well? They, they, going to they, more white schools? Yes, we did a report on this, and it's on our website at the Institute of Metropolitan Opportunity. We did a real uh, 
in-depth analysis of it, and uh, um, children of all races use open enrollment. It tends to favor kids whose parents have cars that can get them to the district. We have a system uh, of open enrollment that kind of tries to balance that uh, called the Choice is Yours. And the Choice is Yours allows about 2,500 kids a year to use open enrollment, but it, the state provides transportation to equalize that. And so that program works reasonably well in terms of kids, low-income kids having a choice to go to higher income schools. But if, if they're dependent on their families, it's harder. Uh, and there's a pattern over time. If we looked, we looked at the pattern, we saw that increasingly, year after year, uh, we saw kids leaving, for example, the St. Louis Park School District going to Minnetonka, or leaving the Hopkins School District to go to Minnetonka, leaving the Eden Prairie School District to go to Minnetonka. Eden Prairie, East Carver County, St. Louis Park, uh, Robbinsdale were racially diverse. And you see a large flow of white children using open enrollment to go to Minnetonka, which is a very white school district. Uh, you don't see kids of color using that for whatever reason. That's a good question to understand why that might be. But you see kids, white kids using that open enrollment system to avoid going to integrated schools a lot and to go to whiter schools uh, another ring further out in the suburbs. Thank you, Senator Weiss. Hmm. Members, I, I do want to move uh, rather quickly. We are behind, but we started behind. Um, I do want to get the uh, Crosswinds uh, testimony in before we do our little break, uh, and then we'll hear from the Romney School uh, after that. Representative Isaacs. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Orfield. Uh, just a quick question. You had said that up until about 93, we were fairly integrated, then 93 on. And for those of us that are aware of the history there, can you explain to me what exactly was occurring around 1993 to see us go from such a good record of integration to what seems to be an increasingly poor record of integration? Well, a lot of things, with big dramatic changes, it's not one thing that happened. I think one uh, issue was the region became a lot more racially diverse. In 1993, we were the second whitest region in the country, now we're the third, and we've had a big increase in diversity. And as places become more diverse, they often become more segregated. So that's a part of it. We also had a very uh, strong integration rule uh, that said that if, school dis if schools were segregated within a district or if there was segregative activity, the state would withhold funds. And so this rule, when it was applied, the school districts paid very close attention to this and they stayed integrated. We also had a very strong metropolitan housing rule. So from, for about 20 years, we were building most of our affordable housing in the whitest part of suburbia in the Twin Cities. So from 1970 till about the early 90s, we built three quarters of all our subsidized housing in the whitest part of the suburbs. And those three things made a huge difference. Having a very, being very white, <laughs> having a very strong civil rights rule, and having a very strong housing rule. We abandoned the housing rule in the 80s completely. Uh, we changed the school desegregation rule in the 1990s, late 90s, to take all the penalties and consequences out of it. Our school desegregation rule actually says right now in its sonar, the statement of needs uh, and uh, uh, the, 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 back, the background administrative documents, says that there is no compelling interest in racial integration. So it, it actually misstates the law uh, presently, the present document does. It was, I think they were trying to read the tea leaves and where the Supreme Court was going. They were looking at some cases in the Fifth Circuit and the Second Circuit, but the Supreme Court in 2007, Justice Kennedy said very clearly, four or five times, and again, several times recently, that there is a compelling governmental interest in avoiding racial isolation. <coughs> so it was the abandonment of our civil rights rules for education, the abandonment of our civil rights rules for housing, and at the same time becoming a lot more diverse. Um, I'll try to be quick, although I have sort of com complicated questions here. I, one thing, I have heard your presentation before and found it very challenging and compelling and appreciate the work that you're doing. Um, one thing you mentioned in a previous presentation was the impact of peers on behavior, especially in the high school age kids, and that that also has a lot of impact on what, ha what happens with, with uh, these issues. Um, I have, a lot of my history is in alternative schools and uh, alternative schools as well. And I've been challenged by this notion of choice. Now, all two schools and charter schools are supposed to be choice schools. Uh, and one of the things as I've gone around the state and talked to different folks, especially from communities of color, they don't like alternative schools, and some of them like charter schools for various reasons, but a lot of the reason is because they feel they have no choice, that they're placed at these places, and there is kind of de facto segregation going on where they, 
they end up in these schools. And I, I guess I'm wondering, uh, I think culture plays a huge role in all of this as well, which gets back to why it isn't just poverty that we're looking at. But you know, I know of kids that don't, don't necessarily fit in a certain school and they get sort of pushed off, perhaps by behavior, perhaps because of not, not really being understood by the administrators or teachers or whatever, or not. And I, I guess my, my question has to do with if you could speak to that uh, issue of culture, but also, also it, it, it occurs to me that integration is something that takes a lot of work and commitment and intent, and it's not something that just happens. You have to really work at it. Right. So, well, I think it, what's the, the notion of choice, and I think one of the questions is do non-white children prefer single-race schools? Is this something that they prefer? Well, there's no evidence in any of the research that that's the case. Uh, if you look at uh, the surveys of kids, there is a small percentage uh, do, very small, less than 10% uh, do, but the vast majority uh, believe that racially integrated schools are their highest goal. Now, not many, a lot of non-white poor kids don't have a choice to go to a racially integrated school. And a lot of times they're going to a really terrible segregated public school. Uh, a person like me doesn't have any uh, qualms about saying that the public schools that are deeply racially and socially segregated are not doing a good job for kids. It's hard. I, I agree with the Supreme Court that segregation is inherently unequal. So kids, I think, that are going to quite segregated public schools sometimes opt into quite segregated charter schools. Uh, but they often, within 18 or 24 months, opt back. <laughs> There's a very short lifespan in these all non-white charter schools. Kids are moving in and out of them at the speed of light, and uh, they aren't doing very well in these schools. They're, you know, the most optimistic projections are that the non-white charter schools are about the same as the non-white public schools. Uh, I think the majority of the research suggests they underperform the public schools at similar levels of income. This question was outlined by the Supreme Court in the, in the, in the Keys, Dayton, and Columbus cases. And in all those cases, the school districts at issue had created single race schools uh, that they were trying to respond, they said, to community goals. Uh, they created single race black high schools, single race black elementary schools in all those three cities. And they had, they had some popularity in all those three cities. The Supreme Court decided this was an unfair practice uh, that to create single race schools to try to incent children away from integrated schools was an evidence of intentional racial segregation. Now, maybe the Supreme Court would think differently now, but the state of the law suggests that the creation of single race schools is uh, evidence of bad uh, intent. Professor Erickson has a question, and then we're gonna, uh, after that, uh, we're gonna move on to um, here testimony from Principal Bass. Uh, Representative Erickson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and welcome, uh, former Representative Orfield. I uh, find your research to be um, very interesting, uh, and yet um, I question this. Uh, to what extent, though, is it always engaged parents, or I should say involved parents, engaged students, and effective teachers that really make the difference? Because I look at Hiawatha Academy, and I look at Crystal Ray, and I look at other public schools in both Minneapolis, St. Paul, and the suburbs who have high achievement based on those three elements. So to what extent are we missing the mark by not focusing more on that? Well, I think you're quite right. Uh, the most powerful predictor of a, a child's success, ed educationally and economically, is who their parents are. So if you look at their parents' income and their educational background and the stability of their marriage, uh, these three things are the most powerfully predictive of a kid's success. If they have educated in parents that have a good income, that have a stable marriage, uh, the odds are really in their favor. So what I say to poor kids all the time is you should go out and get some poor, good parents because that's the most important thing you can do. After that, the most powerful uh, connections to educational success and opportunity is the peer group of kids. It's much more, it's documented to be a much powerful, more powerful relationship than different types of teaching content. So I think the idea is, is that if you can't, have, you don't have these patterns of behavior and success within your own family, which is by far and away much more important than peers. If they don't exist in your own family, the best, the second best place to find these is in a peer group of kids around you. Uh, kids that have, that can help model that behavior, that can show you the way. One of the reasons that poor kids graduate from middle class high schools is because all their peers do. 
one of the reasons that poor kids go to college from middle class high schools is because all their peers do. Uh, one of the reasons that kids uh, go to prison from very poor high schools is because all their peers do. Now, um, I think that Hiawatha Academy and Harvest Prep are showing some really good statistics. Um, there are not many schools like that. There's two or three, there's 122 charter schools, there's two or three that show those kinds of statistics. And I think I would like to see a closer examination of uh, how our kids accepted into these schools. Is there any kind of screening? Is there any kind of, uh, you know, are, are, is, are, just, are, are all kids admitted? Is it the same, are they the same kids? Because if you're picking highly motivated kids, from highly motivated families, you have a different. You're going to have different results. Now, I'm not saying that that's the case. I don't know the answer, but I think it bears some pretty close examination. But there's 122 charter schools. There's three or four really high-scoring ones. There are many. There are multiple times more low-scoring. The love, you know, if you look at the Love Works Academy regularly, you know, almost no one passes the test year after year. So for every Harvest Prep, there's four or five Love Works Academies, and I think that's one of the things that we have to keep in mind. All right, thank you, uh, Representative uh, Orfield. Uh, a conversation to be continued, I hope, and uh, thank you for your uh, testimony and your time here, and for the work uh, that you do in Minnesota as well. Um, I want to ask Mr. Uh, our Principal Bass to come forward. And I know we're pushing, you know, we were supposed to start this part about 20 minutes ago, but we started 15 minutes late, so we're actually uh, running pretty well. Um, if we can't get through all of the uh, Crosswinds testimony by 1230, we'll certainly come back to that, because I do want to hear from the two schools in particular, and, and, and people from, from both those schools um, here today. Um, so we will break at uh, 1230, so Mr. Bass, I think it gives us about 20 minutes, um, and perhaps your testimony might be shorter than that. If, if that's the case, then we'll ask Ms. Uh, Bain Kuzmarski to come forward. If not, we will get her testimony after, after lunch. So uh, welcome to the committee, and it looks like you're setting up a PowerPoint. And again, we will work to uh, get these, uh, these documents up on our website. Um, and so if you do have a PowerPoint in your presentation, if you can share it with staff and uh, with uh, Jamal here, then we can uh, readily do that. So welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and give us your testimony. All right. Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Brian Bass, Crosswinds Principal. I'm just completing my third year as principal here at Crosswinds. I also want to say um, a warm welcome to all of you to Crosswinds and also um, uh, a warm welcome to all of our uh, guests who are here in the, uh, in the audience as well. So I want to acknowledge them as well as well as our board members and the superintendents that are with us from the East Metro this morning. I want to welcome them as well. So thank you. Um, so I've been asked to try to provide a program overview for Crosswinds in the context of uh, this integration conversation that we're having today. So I'm, I'm excited to do that. I'm actually honored to do that. Um, uh, in, in starting off, I was, I was given a letter this morning uh, that was actually addressed to uh, Representative Mariani by one of our uh, middle school math teachers here at Crosswinds, and I think it speaks to what the legacy of Crosswinds uh, has meant to both our students and our staff as it relates to integration. I'd like to start with that and then go through some of the program features here at Crosswinds and then talk a little bit about the results of our efforts um, and then if there are any specific questions that you have for me before we turn it over to our parent and student presenters this morning. So dear Representative uh, Mariani, I am writing to advocate for the proposition that Purpich takes over governance of crosswinds. The death of crosswinds over the past two years has felt, as a teacher here, like an elongated eulogy, but with no death. Our students have been earnest in trying to keep the school alive through the arts and the cross-cultural vibrance that Crosswinds generates. Without intentional integration akin to a school-based immersion program, cross-cultural skills remain stagnant and students regress, surrounding themselves with people that look like them, talk like them, and maybe think like them. Ask a Crosswinds student which friends he keeps and he'll name three or more different cultures. Without intentional integration, we as a people are unchallenged, homogeneous, and frankly, boring. And the arts serve as a channel for cross-cultural communication, 
for students to get beyond curbside superficiality and dig deep to get to a commonality. Only the arts ignites this channel. Preserve crosswinds through purpose. The progressive legacy of a school can't die here. Something rare began here. Simply listen to the whispers of those in the know that tell you integration is what makes this country unlike any other. Just listen. Respectfully, Carl Lepker, sixth grade math teacher here at Crosswinds. The mission and vision of Crosswinds uh, is to provide volunteer integration opportunities for middle school students from urban and suburban communities to enhance achievement and experience diversity in a year-round education program. Additionally, we seek a, di a diverse educational environment where each student's special talents, gifts, and needs are recognized as a way to develop a community of responsible citizens. <laughs> Some of the highlights of our program is the first middle school in Minnesota to bring together urban and suburban students um, with this intentional effort, um, the anchor being St. Paul, and then reaching as far as, um, I think even beyond our suburban, um, into even some, some rural context on the other side of the South Washington County um, School District. Uh, second point here is uh, built upon success of early voluntary joint integration programs in year-round elementary schools, our arts and science magnet, Arts and Science Magnet Focus provides exciting and rigorous educational opportunities. Our, in the first year of the inception of the program, this is what the data looked like on the school in terms of our demographics. 72% uh, urban students, 28% suburban, 52% students of color, and 50% students on free and reduced lunch. So um, this is shortly after the slide, I think, that um, celebrated uh, some of our strongest um, integration efforts across the state. Um, just a few years past that, 1993, I think is what Representative Warfield had mentioned earlier. This is crosswinds today, and this compares us to the state averages. 50% uh, students of color, 23% who receive special education services, so we're slightly overrepresented with students who receive special education services. Uh, students who qualify for free or reduced uh, meals, uh, again, we're 49% there. And then students who receive English language learner services, 12%, just slightly larger than the state average there as well. So our program features what I think um, in some of the questions that you all asked earlier, um, I think what, what is special and significant about bringing students together in an integrated learning environment? And I think there's, there's two kind of uh, pieces here that are the legacy um, that I hope you all walk away with in terms of our presentation about here in EMID is that um, we, we have to have a rigorous educational learning program for our students. They have to have access to highly effective teachers that understand how to meet them where they're at and to accelerate their learning towards benchmarks in a way that, that builds, builds off of the assets that they bring to school from their, their, the different cultural backgrounds of our students. And so that's, that's one that's one key feature. Uh, and so the, the other point uh, here is that many, many schools will, I think we're hearing now, say that they, they have become more integrated and, and they have become more diverse. And we, we argue that simply having greater representation of students of color doesn't make you authentically integrated. It's the way that those students interact. It's the, it's the testimony in Mr. Lubker's letter earlier about the way in which the students are intentionally designed to interact with each other through the curriculum. And so I just I want to make sure that those, those points were, were made here um, in the presentation. So we, we do offer the IB, the International Baccalaureate Middle Years Program, an integrated arts program. We, we have a rich opera, we, we well, rich opportunities for outdoor learning. I'm not sure if when you drove up, um, you, you took a step back. I certainly did when I first drove up to Crosswinds because this is um, an outstanding um, piece of property. We sit on 28 acres and, and, and almost all of the, of the ecosystems in Minnesota are represented on our campus and our students are absolutely immersed and study those different ecosystems through our environmental science curriculum here at Crosswinds. Our facility, as you see, is uh, designed for interdisciplinary open uh, project-based learning, and then we do have an intentional emphasis on intercultural and international 
My goodness. We utilize professional artists and scientists for both curriculum design and instruction. We have recently implemented the Advancement via Individual Termination program, the AVID program, the College and Career Readiness System that many schools are implementing across the state. And then technology is integrated throughout the curriculum. Crosswinds has received in the arts uh, some outstanding acknowledgments and accomplishments in the area of orchestra. Uh, I've been, I included that here in this slide. We have for seven consecutive years earned ratings of superior or above from all of, all of the judges. And we are, we are very proud of that. And this is the fourth time that we've received the ranking of superior with distinction. So we're very proud of the accomplishments of our students. We have integrated themes around intercultural awareness and international mindedness throughout the arts. Um, this production of The Wiz was one example of that uh, that was featured uh, two years ago. In 2012, we had students that participated in the World Savvy Challenge. The World Savvy Challenge. Um, the student who centered, um, who's, who's in the center there, is actually going to be um, speaking to you shortly, as well as the student on the other side. Sam Larson's in the middle, and Nate Celeste there on the end will be speaking to you later. Um, but uh, Sam actually earned a trip to uh, Bangladesh to actually study climate change uh, for several weeks, um, and so uh, so we're very proud of that accomplishment as well. This is uh, our students at work. Oops. Uh-oh. Our data, this is the slide that has the, the, the data on our student achievement as it relates to the Northwest uh, Evaluation Association, uh, or the MAP, the Measures of Academic Progress. And I apologize for this. Uh, And the presentation will be provided to you so that it will have the data, but um, in 2011-2012, in 63% of the students, all students at Crossroads, when we average all students together, met or exceeded the proficiency target for measures of academic progress in their respective grade level. In reading, 65% of the students met or exceeded uh, <clears throat> the national average for proficiency in their respective grade levels. The, the remarkable thing is that many students choose crosswinds um, after having been unsuccessful in some of the larger school experiences, oftentimes being multiple years uh, behind in grade level proficiency. And we're proud to celebrate that, that nearly 95% of our 10th grade students that that moved on last year from crosswinds were proficient at grade level in reading and writing, um, which, is, which is remarkable, considering that they're coming multiple grade levels behind when they enter our system. So, so you've, you've, you've done the work of fostering relationships across cultures, and you've, you've given them access to a curriculum that accelerates their learning from where they're at towards the benchmarks that are there um, on the state assessments. So. Um, very, very, very proud of that accomplishment. Um, here's some additional awards that Crosswinds has earned, and I'll just let you read, read those. I'm not sure the folks in the back can see them very well, so maybe I should read them. Uh, the Minnesota Alliance with Youth, Lieutenant Governor's Red Wagon Award, the Crosswinds Soar Scholars for Improving Student Academic Outcomes, Engaging Youth in Service, St. Paul Rotary Club, Outstanding Accomplishments, Performing Arts Consultants, the Big Apple Classic Grand Champion, that was for our orchestra program, and the Performing Arts Consultant um, for a day in Chicago, Illinois, where our students earn goal rating both our band program and our orchestra program. These are the additional partnerships that we have. I definitely will not read that long list. And that's, and that's, I really wanted to be brief and provided time for you to ask questions if there were some specific uh, points that you wanted to um, address. Yes, please. Uh, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll ask one very quickly. Uh, and then Representative Bernal. Um, so earlier you said the um, that the mere fact that there's greater representation of, of, of uh, different uh, students by race and culture in a school does not necessarily mean that it's integrated. Um, and then you offered up an interpretation uh, from Crosswinds about what that is. And you said that it, it's about how 
uh, the school is intentionally designed for students to interact through the curriculum. I wonder maybe you can expound on that uh, a, a, a little bit. Uh, obviously, for uh, much of our nation's history, we've tended to do the head county, um, you know, aspect of integration. Why is it important to go beyond that? Why is it important to be intentional about designing interactions and doing that through uh, curriculum, and I assume through pedagogical uh, practices as well? Right. Uh, Tony Wagner in uh, Creating Innovators and the Global Achievement Gap um, is, is a leading educational researcher, talks about um, students, if they're going to be prepared for the 21st century, some of these skills are going to be contingent upon their ability to exercise global citizenship skills. And so if students aren't able to interact and create meaning from each other, then they're, they're, they're going to be challenged when they come into the real world uh, workplace because it is global, it is flat, and they're going to be working with, with folks from across the world to solve uh, the issues that we confront as a nation and as a world. And so what that looks like, um, specifically through the IB Middle Years program, is that students engage in a unit of study where they're formulating questions that they will then answer by the end of the unit um, in, a, in a real world issue, in a real world way. So they're taking the content standards that Minnesota has prioritized and said, these are the standards that every student um, should achieve. And then they've, they've said, so how does this relate to the real world? And we're unpacking that curriculum in a real world context for our students that builds from the assets they bring from their cultural, uh, their cultural perspective. And those are celebrated and, and acknowledged in, in their classes. Is that? I'm sorry, uh, Representative Sumber. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Mr. Bass, just a real quick question. I'm not sure if that's still on. Sorry. Just a real quick question. Uh, what is your enrollment here, and what is your average class size? The enrollment when I started three years ago was 450 students. The average class size ranged from uh, 22 to 25, so we do, we do have a, a smaller class size. Um, with the, um, the extended conversation on the closing of the school, uh, we currently sit at about 330 students, and our average class size is 20 today, um, as we've lost a number of students, even in the school year, uh, because of the threat of school closing. A number of families have, have, um, have left us uh, because they're very concerned about uh, transition. Again, a number of our students come to Crosswinds um, looking for a safe learning environment, and, uh, and with the threat of that being pulled, families were quickly doing research and trying to find other alternatives so that they could expedite when that transition came because for some of our students, they become focused on the transition and not on their education. And, and so some parents made some decisions that were best for their families to move their students early. Are there other questions? From, other questions from committee members? If not, then if we're going to break a little bit early, um, and then what I'll do is when we come back, we will um, hear from parents and students uh, in the school, and perhaps uh, Principal Bass, you can introduce them uh, at, at, at that time. Um, so members, let me explain um, what we're going to do, and actually we probably need some help from you as well in terms of where folks should be going. So under house rules, um, the way this works is that we individually pay for the lunch, that gets reimbursed in our per diem. Um, and and I take it you've got someone that can collect that uh, from members. Uh, I think we can provide refreshments at a small level. I don't know if we've done that or not. Um, and so uh, perhaps you can just explain to members uh, where to go and who to see. And then um, we'll aim to be back here at about, a, so very short, about a quarter to two. And that will give us about five minutes to settle in, and then we'll start in again with the, uh, with the testimony. So, Mr. Bass, sure. if you could just explain uh, where we're going and how we're doing this. Sure. So, the, the cost is $875, um, and you can hand it off to me, and then I will pass that to the appropriate person. Um, what we'll do is, uh, there is a buffet, there's a taco bar here uh, in this room uh, to uh, Mr. Celeste is over for us. And then there is seating over here on this side, so if you want to come in and grab your plate, and then you can come back around. Um, and there are tables there for you to eat. Also, restrooms. If you need to use the restroom, you'll just come out and turn to your right, and there are restrooms down the hallway there. So thank you. Enjoy. Enjoy your lunch.
right, thank you. So members will move uh, relatively quickly and we'll be back here in about 15 minutes. So until then, we're uh, recessed. All right, why don't we uh, gather back together here? I really appreciate uh, being able to move you along uh, quickly. Um, so I, I appreciate your diligence, members, and um, uh, quickly uh, grabbing your lunch, eating it, and, and uh, sharing uh, with one another. Um, just so the public knows, uh, legislators are very skilled individuals. We know how to do that uh, really well. We know how to eat and run and connect and uh, do all sorts of things all at the same time. Um, so thank you all uh, for uh, reconvening quickly uh, in the audience as well. So the next uh, part of today's uh, testimony will involve um, hearing from parents and students uh, from the Crosswind School. Um, and then we're going to move into uh, a similar interaction with um, um, community members from the Harambe School. And um, Principal Bass, I'm going to have you basically um, direct this portion of, of the testimony. Uh, we'll try to have uh, some time for some questions. We won't do super long questions, uh, but you know, uh, two or three questions, and then we'll move on to the, the next group as well. So, Principal Bass. Sure, we have two parents. Our first parent is Tammy Bain Kusmarski. Next, we have Kelly DeBrine. And then we have three students uh, from your right to left, uh, Sam Larson, 10th grade student, Nate Celeste, 10th grade student, and Juan Jimenez, 10th grade student, who is an international exchange student from Colombia, who is with us this morning. All right. Wonderful. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record. That's just sort of our, our you know, so you all know when you start out, you state your name and that gets uh, uh, your, your we, we record that. Uh, in our, uh, our reports and our recordings here, and then offer your testimony. So thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Tammy Bain Kuzmarski. Um, my formative school years were in the late 60s and early 80s. Um, the first six years um, of my life were experienced through military schooling as my father was in the Air Force. Those experiences were in Wisconsin and Illinois. Integration at the military schools I was privileged to attend was never an issue. Then my family moved to Minnesota in 1974. I went from a melting pot of cultures and nationalities to be one of the two persons of color in my new elementary school, which had just opened up. I quickly learned that Minnesota nice wasn't always really nice. It started with the assumption my new teacher made by asking if I needed help after I had so quickly finished all my placement testing in what seemed to him to be an impossible speed for someone of color from down south. Junior high brought more kids of color to the neighborhood school through busing. This was the solution to diversity in St. Paul at the time. The only problem is many of the students who were bused across from um, town would have rather remained in their neighborhood school. As a result, a large amount of these students were disruptive in the classroom and exhibited violence towards others who were not bused in, but of their same race. This is not the model of integration we want to replicate. Sorry. Um, my daughter um, is now at Crosswinds. Um, my formative years in um, high school were a bit better. Uh, I have to say in junior high there were times because of the bullying um, I wouldn't go to the last day of school. My parents sent me to school um, to participate in school 
um, and to learn, and other students weren't necessarily there for those reasons. My daughter has been at Crosswinds and has experienced a lot of cross-cultural um, incentives that she probably would not have experienced had she attended the neighborhood school or through the school lottery system. And this has been invaluable in watching my daughter develop. Um, I, I encourage you to really look at this program. I think it's a model program. I think it's one that nurtures um, growth through students. My daughter, Megan, has been here since seventh grade. She's now in 10th grade. And so that's where the school stops. But this is important enough to me to ask that you keep the school open so other kids have this as a choice. Um, we live in a neighborhood that is kind of diverse, but the majority of, of our neighbors, and it's a St. Paul neighborhood, and the section we've chosen is pretty affluent, but most of the, the parents there do not send their kids to neighborhood schools. They either send them out of district or um, with school choice, they're not the direct neighborhood school. There have been some changes in St. Paul now um, where lines have been divided, and it looks like it's gonna be the same situation that I grew up with. And so keeping this as an option for kids that don't fit that model, that don't want to be bullied, that need the safety piece, which my daughter has, ex um, has been able to um, have at the school has been my ultimate goal. Not only the safety, but the art piece. And through art, my daughter has tried different modes of art, um, be it band or theater. And from that, her outside curricular activities have excelled as well, because she carries on the legacy of art by through her dance. So I thank you for your time. Thank you, ma'am. But I wonder very quickly, uh, I want to go back to something that I had asked uh, Principal Bass earlier, um, because I was struck by your uh, comment earlier about your first experience as a student in what is a, um, quote, bad integration plan. Um, Mr. Bass said that part of the, the power of the design here is that there's an intentionality to the interaction of students. Was that missing or lacking uh, in your experience when you were uh, experiencing an integrated uh, busing situation that there was um, that there was not an intentional effort to have students interact with one another across uh, race and culture? I think probably the hardest part was the students that were bused in. There were a few of us minorities that lived in the area. The students that were bused in were taken from their home district where they would have rather been. I'm not sure how the politics came into play there, but you could tell they weren't there necessarily to contribute positively. And that's unfortunate because that's their education as well. So, so the issue of choice, uh, the, 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 those uh, students and parents were, were not actively choosing uh, that particular learning environment. That's, that's the feeling I got. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you for your testimony. Thank you. And Ms. De Devine, is that correct? It's, uh, Kelly DeBrine. DeBrine. Um, Welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to address this, this um, committee. Um, I just want to share a little bit of my background. I went through the Little Rock Public School systems between 1975 and, and 1983, and I graduated from Little Rock Central High 26 years after the nine black students had been turned away and the schools were closed and all of that turmoil. Um, in my junior year, uh, 60 Minutes came to do a piece on the school to show how much progress we had made, and there was a lot of... Um, collective amnesia at the time, and that's something that I think that I'm afraid of now is that we're having a lot of collective amnesia about the need for integration as one of the ways that we can build community amongst the different um, um, uh, communities that we have in our state. Um, I found Crosswinds by accident, and I want to tell you, um, I think, what are the valuable things that they do here that would extend into policy as far as integration moving forward in the state of Minnesota. Um, I, I come from District 833, and in February, I think probably you all might be aware, there was a, 
uh, an event where um, some student at Eastridge um, had read a controversial poem over the uh, intercom during Black History Month. And I, I think that that's an example of the kind of um, community fear and outrage and disruption that happens when you don't have intentional ways of building community and providing cultural context for the students that you are educating in, in your schools. Um, so the, I thought that was a very unfortunate and a, um, thing that happened in my home district, but I chose to send my kids to Crosswinds because um, there wasn't a whole lot of diversity um, acceptance of cultural differences. I mean, one of the um, t-shirts that my son wore at, at the elementary school was be nice because it's right. So slogans don't get you to that deep engagement and that relationship building. Um, I think Crosswinds through the arts and um, the sciences curriculum, they bring the kids cultural context into everything that they're doing. And that has enriched my, my children immensely. And um, I w would love for the state to consider policies that strengthen the requirements for how you, how you deliver an integrated, uh, an education to an integrated population. Um, I was bused in, in 1975 um, out of my home district into, I mean out of my you know, neighborhood into um, a school that was majority African American. And I, I appreciated that experience because the, I, I, I was of the majority, I guess, and my experience was that I got respect and I was treated well. But um, that was two years into the busing, and it was two years after learning that you can't just throw them into a school. There was more happening after they had started the experiment with busing. So, I mean, I think integration is, is more about um, extending the community, providing cultural context, and, and Crosswinds has done that really well here through the arts, and I think the arts are a part of a, a, a crucial part of it because there are so many ways that you can draw kids out into um, understanding their, each other's experiences. And so, you know, when we were presented with the opportunity to be governed differently through a state agency, I thought the Purpose, agent, the Purpose Center was a, um, probably the best scenario because one of the challenges that we had was this sense of competition amongst the districts for the pupil to, per pupil dollars. And so the governing board, unfortunately, was not able to, to shepherd the mission of integration for the students. Um, when we entered the district in 2008, 2009, the school was full. It was almost at 600 students. Um, but when the, when the legislature began to question integration dollars and the, the, the um, superintendents of the school districts in the collaborative were questioning whether, whether the funding was going to continue, that's really when all the, the discussion started about closing the schools because they um, felt like that per pupil dollars, what they were getting was more important in their home districts and they should, they, they should rightly be fighting for their districts. But that's the problem with this governance model and so I'm hoping that moving forward integration efforts won't be left to individual districts to decide what they want to do. And hearing that testimony this morning from um, Mr. Orfield, Representative Orfield, um, it, it heartened me that, that we actually did used to have these conversations and that we used to be committed and believed in and requirements and, and rules that would alleviate some of the segregation that we have. So um, that's what I'd like to say. I think it's a valuable model and if there's a way to inform policy going forward for the state of Minnesota, I hope that this experience can be a learning lab and that the schools can continue. Thank you, Mr. Bryan. We'll hear a little bit later about uh, governance uh, uh, issues when we uh, have a conversation with the, uh, some of the EMIT uh, administrators. Uh, bienvenido. Que bueno que está aquí con nosotros. Vamos a platicar solamente en español. Bienvenido. 
Why don't you give us your name and give us your testimony? Um, my name is Juan Camilo Jimenez. I'm from Colombia and I'm an exchange student. And what I wanted to say here is that uh, I go in Colombia to the third most expensive school in Colombia. I pay $2,000 a year to get the education that people get here almost for free. The education that uh, Crossman's offered is the same that I received in Colombia. I find this just amazing. I mean, when I got here, my expectations for an American school, I had never seen the Crossman building or how I was going to be treated or the teachers. All I was based on was documentaries about bullying or movies. <laughs> so my first, my first expectation was go inside and find a metal detector. <laughs> so the first day I got here, I didn't find a metal detector. I found uh, a bunch of teachers just being uh, grateful to students. You could interact with teachers here at Crosswinds. You can talk to them. They will talk to you like friends. They won't talk to you like an adult would talk to you. They, they, they respect you. They see a person in you, not, a, not only a student. And I think that's one of the greatest things this school has. Um, coming here to Crosswinds, I think, uh, has changed my life. This is probably the best school I've ever attempted. And I expected to see a square school when I came here, but just looking from the outside, you can see there's, there's ideas behind the building, behind the people that study here, that teach here. Ms. Romero, she's our teacher. She has never been one day out of school. She has, by now, like 10 weeks, only for uh, sick days. And she's never failed one day to come to school, even when she's sick. <laughs> she's personally my favorite teacher right now. <laughs> um, I don't know what else I can say. My brother, he is also planning on being an exchange student next year. And honestly, he was supposed to come here. I don't know what he's going to do now. Uh, I don't know what to say anymore. I mean, my bro, <laughs> my brother, my host family brother, the family I live with, he goes to Simley High School um, in Inver Grove. I think I pass through that school every morning on my school bus, and I see every morning a police car outside. I don't know what's the reason. It's probably not even a reason. It's probably just waiting there in case something happens. You don't see that here. I think in all the time I've been here, I've only seen a cop car once, and it was probably for a mistake. I don't know. <laughs> I think that's it, all I have to do. Thank, Thank you. you Thank much. you for your testimony. You're going to have to teach your, your friend Spanish over there. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Welcome to the committee. Uh, hi. Um, good afternoon. Uh, committee chair, members of the committee. My name is Sam Larson. Uh, I'm a 10th grader here at Crosswinds. Uh, going to uh, integrations, an integration school and um, specifically Crosswinds uh, has meant a lot to me because um, for the first years of my education, I went to um, a very uh, a not diverse or integrated school. Um, in my class, there was not a single non-white student. And when I came here, there was a very big change in the fact that suddenly my classmates came from all these different cultures and backgrounds and just areas around Minnesota. And this made it a diverse school. But once I started, uh, once as I settled in here, um, the teachers and staff um, created an environment that was very open and caring. And the fact that uh, all of our students, everyone here could share with each other and like, um, you, and like our backgrounds and our perspectives and where we come from. And as we and then we can learn that from each other and you know see it from the other person, is what made it an integrated school and what made it so that we could all understand each other and not only like we didn't just learn perspectives from each other but like it made us be able to look at other things and from other people's perspective. And I think that's uh, something that is a part of an integration program that Crosswinds handles so well, and I think it's important for every student to be able to experience. 
and is a big part of being able to develop into uh, a world citizen. Now I hope that this school can continue and can be a model for other schools to be able to teach that kind of education. Thank you. Thank you, very well said. Uh, good afternoon, welcome. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Nate Sliss and I'm a current 10th grader here at Crosswinds. Um, Crosswinds is a very special school um, because the staff work um, to create this integrated environment. Um, as Sam was saying, you know, because of the places we pull from, we are diverse, and that's something that a lot of schools have. But the teachers here really care and they really work to create an environment, as Sam was saying, that you know, kids feel comfortable sharing. Um, Juan talked about how teachers treat us as people, not as like kids. And that's something that's really helpful in creating this environment. And because we have this environment where we feel like we can share our ideas and kind of the cultures that we come from and the backgrounds that are creating on our, our ideas, um, we end up getting a much deeper and in-depth and enriched look at the topics we're learning about. Um, and it really helps us to kind of see the whole topic and not just our angle on the topic. It puts us into, it lets us see multiple perspectives and you know it really pushes us and I think that's something that's important and I think programs like what we have here at Crosswinds um, are something that should be maintained and nurtured and spread throughout the state and even the country. So, thank you. Thank you, Nate. Are there any uh, questions or observations from committee members? If not, Juan, Nate, um, and Sam, thank you uh, for coming, and thank you um, to both our parents as well. Thank you, uh, Principal Bass. Uh, at this point, I'll ask our uh, Harambe uh, testifiers to come forward. And we have uh, Ms. Kathy Greibel, who's principal of the Harambe School. And I have um, also listed here Julian, or Jocelyn Stein, uh, who's a parent at Harambe. Good afternoon and welcome. Good afternoon, Chair Mariani, representatives. Um, for the record, my name is Kathy Griebel, and I am the principal at Harambe Community Cultures Environmental Science School. And like Crosswinds, we're an integration magnet school, and we serve students from St. Paul and many other suburban communities. I had a PowerPoint. I had all kinds of remarks. I know we're on a tight schedule, so I think I'm just going to speak from my heart. Because the students and the parents that you just heard from really said everything that I was going to talk about. Um, I think you'll have at your spots a, um, a handout about Harambe, and you can read about our, our features, um, the things about our school. Like Crosswinds, we are a year-round school. Um, we serve a very diverse student population. Um, but what I think I want to talk to you about this afternoon is those daily acts of integration. There's been a lot of questions about what does it look like on a day-to-day -day basis. And you heard Dr. Orfield talk about um, the physical segregation and the physical integration. And there were questions about, well, what difference does it make once you get inside the school walls? Um, I think we need both. We need those structures of... Um, policy and procedure to create those integrated opportunities, but if we don't do anything different within the school walls, we're just going to have segregated schools within the schools. Um, what we see in our schools are those, it's that intangible daily integration and interaction with students, teachers, families that makes the difference. And it is intentional. It's something that, that we work hard at. It's, it's the water that we swim in every day. And Juan talked about perceptions about American schools. And so this morning, um, this week at Harambe, we have um, 10 visitors from South Korea all week, student teachers, that are coming to learn about American schools. And I put a message on our board this morning and asked our students, what would you like our South Korean visitors to know about American schools? And it was fascinating to read their responses. Um, one kindergarten said, um, white people and black people don't need to fight. That was his response. Another said, we're all friends. Another said, we have cultures that all come together. 
this is their experience. This is their school. That's what they live every day. And that's what they, the teachers talk with them about every day. It's, it's something that, that is intentional and is something that is part of every experience that they have. Um, so that's what an integrated school is. It's one that, that talks about different cultures. And families are, we have families that come to our school for so many different reasons. They might come for year round. They might come for environmental science or community cultures, but what keeps them at our school is integration. It's those experiences that they have in that, in that moment that they can't find elsewhere. And we understand that we're not going to desegregate St. Paul and the East Side with two magnet schools. But these are models. You heard the parents talk to you about these models that are um, extraordinarily successful. And so we need more opportunities for these kinds of experiences for kids and families, not less. So I appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit about Harambe with you. Um, I'm going to let you hear from one of our parents, and then um, Chair Mariani, we can stand for questions. Thank you, uh, Ms. Griebel. And uh, we have uh, Ms. Jocelyn Stein. Welcome. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, committee members, and good afternoon. Um, my name is Jocelyn Stein, and I have a daughter at Harambe and a son and daughter at Crosswinds. My son is moving on from Crosswinds to complete high school at Purpich Arts High School this fall. Crosswinds and Harambe have given our family so much, and I want to talk briefly with you about why I choose integration and the arts for my family. Integration is important to me because I believe it's critical for a growing child to learn about where they fit into the world's picture and how they can best contribute their unique gifts and talents to making the world a better place for all. An integrated educational environment teaches kids these lessons on a daily basis, as Kathy mentioned. Minnesota is becoming more diverse, a more diverse state, and an integrated educational environment teaches kids to respect that diversity of gifts and talents on a daily basis. I've learned so much from my kids during their time at these amazing schools. My son has been at Crosswinds since sixth grade, and last year we decided to enroll our youngest at Harambe because I wanted her to experience more integration in her school than she was currently getting in our home district. And the year-round schedule allows kids to keep their learning going strong throughout most of the summer, as well as the whole year. This turned out to be a wonderful decision because my fourth grader comes home nearly every day talking about how much she loves the teachers and staff at Harambe. She's challenged and engaged and appreciates that the teachers ask the kids what they want to learn about, taking student input into consideration when developing their teaching plans. My daughter feels heard and part of a community, and that's really important to me. While I received a good education growing up in suburban Minneapolis, it was not truly an integration-focused education, nor was it an arts-focused education. I really want something different for my kids than I had growing up. Harambe and Crosswinds are truly unique for this. Kids learn about why being different is actually a good thing, and they don't feel much pressure to be like everyone else. Their differences are truly embraced and encouraged by the staff and their fellow students. The arts help kids learn positive ways of expressing themselves and discovering their own unique talents. The kids learn about the value of community, and this lesson will serve them wherever they go in life. One of the most fulfilling moments in my life has been recently watching my two Crosswinds kids perform in scenes together in the recent Crosswinds production of West Side Story. I watched the play over and over and discovered something new and exciting with each performance with all these young actors, singers, and dancers. It was living testimony of the power of integration in the arts. Many of these kids would never have thought they would take the risk of getting up on that stage to perform in front of their peers, their parents, their teachers, their friends' parents, and members of the community, but they did it and it was amazing. These kids know they're supported by the Crosswind staff and their friends. They know it's a safe place to take smart risks that will help them grow and achieve all their potential. This is just one example. The kids are also demonstrating what they've learned and how they've blossomed in, at literary night, in the artwork you see around the school, in the school's garden, in the 10th graders' personal projects, and in the award-winning orchestra. To see the smiles on their faces at the cast party awards ceremony was priceless. There just aren't words to describe how proud they all were of their accomplishments. This is not an accident, but rather an intentional consequence of the skill and dedication of the staff to the mission of integration and respect. This is a model for other districts. This is something that districts like EMID could learn from partners like Purpich, who have stressed statewide professional development as part of their mission. 
Rupich works with school districts all across the state to share their expertise about integrated arts education. To consider this at the middle school level is truly an exciting proposition for all Minnesotans. The synchronicity between Harambe, Crosswinds, and Purpich is palpable, and that's why we're choosing Purpich for my son to finish his K-12 journey. Purpich weaves integration in naturally through its emphasis on the arts and helping kids to not only discover their gifts and talents, but to hone in on how they can best serve the world and their community after high school. I always knew I wanted to encourage my kids to apply to Purpich, but when I walked into Purpich for the first time, it really hit me that this is where they belong and will thrive the most. Purpich will help complete the integration story that Harambe and Crosswinds have so beautifully begun. One of my greatest hopes is that come fall, I will have a child in each of these remarkable schools. It's my hope for my own kids, but also for the wider community to have a chance to choose an integrated arts-focused education like this. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Stein. Uh, Ms. Grieve, I'm, I'm curious, uh, well, actually both of you spoke about uh, Harambe as a model. Uh, you said that <clears throat> it's, it's only two men in schools, uh, after all, and we're talking, oh my gosh, gotta be over 100,000 uh, school uh, students in the uh, uh, East Metro uh, school districts. Uh, so only two bandit schools. Um, so, uh, and, and, and I'll ask this when we interact with you, uh, representatives as well, but tell us a little bit about um, whether, I don't wanna get you in trouble here, but to, to what extent uh, have these mag two magnet schools served as models for uh, surrounding communities? Um, and, and then a little tougher question is, well, why not just let each individual school district figure this stuff out by themselves? So those are good questions. I think um, not enough is in answer to your first question of how much have we been that model. Um, it's interesting that higher ed seems to understand the value that these schools can offer, maybe more than our, um, our counterpart districts do. Um, we have terrific partnerships with lots of higher ed institutions who want to place students with us, who want to have visitors come and see our programming. Um, this summer alone, we've had visitors from South Korea, from Saudi Arabia. Um, we had a doctoral group um, from St. Cloud State. Groups that in higher ed, they understand that this is reform happening in education, and they see that. Um, it, it's been a little bit more difficult to figure out how do we bring what we're doing here at, at Harambe and Crosswinds to our member districts. And we don't pretend to be perfect. We, don't, we know we don't have all the answers. Um, we're struggling through a lot of the very same challenges that, that they're struggling with in their communities. How do we, how do we address these disparities um, in outcomes with students? Um, and that's where I think your second question comes into play. We, no, no one of us can figure this out alone. This really is about a community working together. And I think that's one of the, the powerful things about a collaborative is that opportunity to share, to share practices, to talk about successes and failures, to, um, to really be those models for one another. And again, we, we can't be everything about integration for the East Metro, but we can be one of those shining lights that other people could look to. Um, we also have um, had that opportunity to connect with what's happening in their districts because there are amazing things happening throughout the East Metro. Um, we just need to be sharing that more. I think Harambe's, Harambe, if you don't know, is a Swahili word that means working together for a common purpose. And we chose that name very purposefully when we named our school because we feel like that's what, what we're doing at Harambe. We are working together, not just within our school community, but within our region. So let me just ask you a, a softball question, I, I believe, and, and perhaps Ms. Stein. So why isn't it just important enough for um, public policy to simply expect that all our students um, are just the best at reading, writing, and math. Uh, why isn't that enough? Why, why, why is it that you feel that whatever's happening in this school is uh, perhaps as important or at least important? Um, obviously, I'm kind of pushing at why, you know, why this is even relevant at all. 
Uh, we have great teachers, we have great schools all over, among your mem member districts that perform well in reading, writing, and math. Uh, why isn't that enough for us as a society? I think the intentionality um, that so many of the speakers have talked about, um, about why the integration really works and why it helps um, the kids learn, and, and the staff and the teachers, as I mentioned, are just and other speakers have mentioned too, are just really um, very, very um, conscientious about that and about um, really embracing those differences among all the kids, and not just racially, but um, culturally, and um, just all the di all the differences that we all bring to the table, and and really just leveraging those those talents and those gifts that kids have in naturally and and seeing how they can really harness them to do the best that they can for their for their schooling and then beyond also and that's why i think having the purpose um, option is is so exciting because purpose really has the ability to take this message out to the whole state and i think that is just really an exciting proposition for all of us because i think um, Purbitch naturally also has an integration, even though it may not say it in, in explicitly, I think it's there. I think they use integration through the arts, so I just, I think it's a really exciting opportunity. I think something that, um, that we, we forget is the, the mutuality of, um, of our learning. And oftentimes we think about, when we think about integration, we think about um, we're benefiting kids of color. And I, I, my experience is that it's a mutual benefit. We're all benefiting from this. Um, Mr. Bass talked about how flat our world has become and that we need to be able to connect with people that are different than we are and have those experiences. Um, a former student who's now in high school, um, she went to Harambe, she went to Crosswinds, she talks about how are we as human beings supposed to get along with people who are different than us if we're never given the opportunity to learn how to do that. And so, yes, reading and writing is important, but we read and write for a purpose, and that's to communicate with people. And if we don't learn how to communicate with someone that, that has a different experience than we do, then we haven't given kids a true education. Thank you. Uh, members, uh, questions, thoughts? All right. Well, then, thank you, Ms. Griebel, Ms. Stein, uh, for your wonderful testimony. And now we'll um, <clears throat> spend the next, uh, I think, 30 minutes. Uh, hold on. Uh, Representative Dan. Th thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm a little slow on the, uh, the, the switch here. I apologize. Quite all right. I am pondering, particularly given this last panel, but the thread that's been uh, woven throughout today of Chair Marcourt's uh, focus on a 21st century workforce. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm intrigued with the thread that has been built here today when I think of Re Chair Marcourt's focus on building a 21st century workforce. And the question, that I believe the last question that you posed about why isn't reading, writing, and, and arithmetic enough? Uh, why, why isn't it just the, the hard skills that are important? But what we increasingly hear from the business community is the soft skills. And that, that's everything from you got to you know, show up with your shirt tucked in uh, and a few, few things like that to a work ethic and inability to get along with all of your coworkers and get along with all the customers who are coming in the door or that you're reaching out to depending on your position. And the comfort level with an increasingly diverse America seems to me to be a strategic value, added value that the students at Harambe and Crosswinds can go into higher education and into the, the marketplace with. And it was just starting to pull some of those, the themes we hear in the K-12 Education Finance Committee with the themes that are developing here uh, into a package for me. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, members, comments, uh, thoughts? Senator Isaacson, I, I heard you, I sit close enough to you, I heard you uh, mumbling agreement with that. Um, sure. Uh, 
Thank you, Chairman. I, I have to share that uh, when I was in um, seventh grade, my family moved out to New York, and I went to a school where in West Fargo, North Dakota, uh, we had uh, one person who wasn't white in the school, and that person had white parents, and so a lot of the cultural changes weren't even relevant for that person at the time. To a school in which I was one of five kids with blonde hair, and one of about 14 white kids in a school of about 2,000 African Americans. And um, uh, a testament to a couple of things. First of all, having gone to a middle class school as a poor white kid, I, I was a horrible student uh, in elementary school and, and junior high, and I tested into this school's highest classes. Uh, and, and then once I was there, um, uh, uh, the experience of, of, of uh, integration um, was very eye-opening. And luckily, I had parents that um, walked me through and made me process what I was experiencing rather than just acting emotionally or as a victim or whatever. And uh, it forever shaped the way that I see how integration should work now. Uh, and, and this idea of an intentional integration that's going to find its, its, its values and how we culturally approach each other beyond just the hard uh, subjects, I think, is imperative. Uh, it is to sit with your head in the sand to believe that we can continue on the path we are and hopefully expect to have an educated workforce and a successful primary and secondary education system. Uh, and so for me, uh, that coupled with some other experiences in going to an alternative high school myself, uh, not by choice necessarily, but uh, allowed me to really see and, I, and, and really want to see this school be an example and as someone suggested, a light that shines for other schools to see that progress moving forward. And, and that ties into what Representative Daddy is talking about because that is going to be part of, not just one part, but part of a, a bigger symphony that needs to happen of people that, that want to move us towards a workforce that is going to be successful and competitive on a global level uh, and preparing kids out of high school regardless of demographic or socioeconomic segregation uh, that might exist right now that, that just is essential. And so that's why my heart and where I'm at with this with this school and, and, and Harambay is making sure that we follow through with those things and provide those opportunities uh, uh, so we can be successful moving forward. I hate it when as government we solve problems for right now and we don't solve problems for 10 to 15 uh, years down the road. And that's something I'd like to see us moving towards. Thanks. Thank you. I think Representative Ward also wants to share something. Thank you. First of all, uh, Representative Mariani, I am the committee. I'd like to thank you for letting me be a part of this conversation. Um, some of you may have heard NPR this morning 9, 15, 9, 10, when the program started, a uh, conversation about women and technology. And I just want to build a little bit on what some of the students were saying about being respected as individuals. The whole point of the conversation on radio this morning was about how women are not really well represented in technological fields. And why is that? And so one of the, some person called in and said, women don't really like programming. And one of the responses was, the first programming language was written by a woman. Thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, that most men started getting into technology, into these technological companies, because they were profitable. They made lots of good money. And they kind of squeezed women out. And now we are at a point where Companies are, um, that are high-tech companies are 90% men, and those men don't understand because they don't see other women there. They don't see them. Now, women don't like that stuff. Well, that's because they don't see women there, and they only relate to each other generally as white men. Just another example of how we need to change the workforce and that has to start with kids. Thank you, Representative uh, Urissa. Thank you. Um, we talked a little bit in the course here about the, you know, the question of whether racial integration is what's um, needed as the focus, or couldn't you just be looking at poverty? And the thing is, is that in the country as a whole, and especially in Minnesota, um, race and poverty are bound together. Uh, it has historical reasons, it has societal reasons that perpetuate it, and it particularly shows up 
in housing segregation. And um, my family was, uh, we participated in open enrollment, but in the reverse manner from what was talked about here, um, I drove my, two of my three kids into St. Paul so they could attend a school on the, on the east side, Nicomas Montessori. Uh, there were two other families, and we were able to do that because we could have this three-family carpool, and that does get into some of the difficulties for families. We had to get them there. Um, but they went from a school in which my son was one of five redheads in his first grade classroom to being the only redhead in the school. At the time, his sister was blonde. She went red later. But, um, <laughs> So the only redhead in the school. So that was quite a shift. And uh, there was um, maybe about, I think it was about 40% free and reduced lunch at the school at the time. Quite a large contingent of, of students um, whose parents didn't speak English at home. And so that was a, a really, really different experience for my kids. And it was terrific, but I think one of the important things there was not just that they were now in a racially integrated school, but they were in an economically integrated school. Because there were kids from all over St. Paul and these three kids from Shoreview, North Oaks, or five kids, excuse me. Um, and that's an opportunity that kids have less and less and less and less now because our development patterns are such that we're creating more economic segregation rather than less. And I think as a result, my kids had an exposure to much more realistic expectations about how the world worked than some of their peers uh, that they went to high school with. Thank you. At this point, I'm going to ask um, uh, Bruce Haggerty, Shan, or Sh I'm sorry, Shari Thompson, and uh, Sherry Thompson, and Jerry Moore uh, to come forward. And uh, Mr. Haggerty, um, you're a former uh, member of the UMED Joint Powers Board. Uh, Shari, Sh Sherry, I, I keep it mixing up your Sherry. name. Sherry is the Business Services Director for the East Metro Integration District. And Jan Moore is the current superintendent of the East Metro Integration District. And I'll let you decide how the three of you uh, want to proceed with your testimony. I'll go last. Uh, I'd be happy to go first. Uh, you'll probably want to pull that mic close to you. Chair Mariani, uh, representatives, uh, committee staff, uh, thank you for the opportunity to participate uh, in this uh, hearing this afternoon. It's also uh, provided me an opportunity to connect with a number of the uh, EMID staff with whom uh, I had the privilege of working for so many years, and also gave me an opportunity to reconnect with a former South St. Paul School District uh, uh, employee who uh, now, uh, as I'm sure you will find out, uh, graces the halls of the House of Representatives. I'm pleased to see Representative Ward uh, here, and I am also pleased to see her in your house. Um, I served for uh, 12 years as a South St. Paul School Board member from 1999 through 2010. I served as a board member for the East Metro Integration District for 11 of those 12 years and served 10 of those years as either vice chair or chair of the uh, EMIT Board of Directors. Um, we, South St. Paul, was one of the uh, early members to um, the uh, Voluntary Integration uh, District that was formed. We were one of the contiguous districts to St. Paul. We were also joined at that time by some voluntary districts who joined the collaborative, Invergrove Heights, Stillwater, Montemedi, I think were the voluntary participants at that particular time, along with the other districts that were adjacent to or contiguous to the St. Paul District. Um, the Joint Powers Agreement that was drafted by the 10 collaborative members uh, called for a board to be formed uh, and 
representatives to that board to be members of the individual member district board of directors. There were also opportunities to select alternatives and my recollection is that alternative members could at times be district staff members not required to be board members but through our long history it was generally the rule that the EMIN representatives were board members from the member districts. Um, we enjoyed a, a significant period of continuity in our leadership from 2002 up until uh, mid-year 2010 with the uh, marvelous uh, leadership of formerly retired uh, Superintendent Carl Wallstrom, uh, who was coaxed out of retirement for a short assignment that we were able to uh, continue for, uh, for nine years of terrific, terrific leadership uh, in the uh, EMID district. Uh, Carl implemented some, some very interesting meeting groups that helped uh, 10 disparate districts with different uh, perspectives, different ambitions, different aims, and 10 different member district superintendents who we can likewise assume had different perspectives, different aims. And so I and Carl uh, helped develop the collaborative into a truly collaborative experience. Um, he devised uh, what simply became known as the uh, Superintendent Steering Committee, which polled uh, four superintendents, three board members, and staff together uh, to meet on a monthly basis and to truly begin to understand uh, each other on a far more uh, uh, collegial level uh, than was uh, available in a uh, regular board meeting uh, session so that we began to understand the perspectives of a Roseville. We understand what brought a Stillwater and a Montevideo as voluntary members to the collaborative. And he also uh, implemented monthly superintendent meetings uh, with the superintendents so that likewise those 10 <coughs> superintendents of the member districts uh, were also able to foster uh, a relationship of uh, interaction that wasn't necessarily available to them uh, over that period of time. Um, things started to change. Uh, things started to change in 2007, 2008, um, and in change uh, really begins to get woven through the latter years of uh, Emit's uh, history here. We um, had some some uh, situations that were somewhat uh, difficult for the collaborative. We had uh, North St. Paul identified as a race with a, a district with a racially isolated school, and they were allowed in the uh, uh, legislation to pull out of our collaborative and reorganize as a uh, collaborative district for voluntary integration purposes with other schools that were adjacent to them. Took them a year to find one, but they were, they were able to uh, find Matamidae uh, to join them in a collaborative effort in North St. Paul and meet Matamidae, excuse me, Matamidae now collaborate on integration activities. Um, so we lost two very valuable members, members who've been at the table for a long, long time. Um, interestingly, as North St. Paul pulled out of the collaborative, 94% uh, of the students from District 632 who were enrolled in PMID schools, Harlem Bay or Crosswinds, voted with their feet to stay in EMID schools and not return to North St. Paul schools. Again, uh, even if the districts didn't understand the, the import or impact of open enrollment, the parents of the students understood. 
they had opportunities to send the children where they chose. These weren't district students. These were state of Minnesota students, and they were free to choose where the student would attend. They chose to remain generally in the East Metro Integration District. We struggled for years uh, trying to make the crosswinds model work, truly work. Uh, appropriate uh, enrollment, appropriate class sizes, and we did that in a variety of ways. First of them would have been in the mid-2000s. We added two grades. Originally, we were a six, seven, eight, or seven, six eight. eight? Six through eight. We went out on a limb and added nine and 10. Uh, a lot of consternation about that, but we added uh, additional programming here. As recently as 2009, uh, this EMID district ran a task force comprised of administrators, member superintendents, board members, staff, <coughs> to examine uh, in a further addition to <coughs> class uh, programming and considered adding 11th and 12th grade. The task force brought forward a recommendation to the board to include uh, 11th and 12th grade uh, programming here and be a conclusion. Up till then, the, the concept had been they'd stay in your EMID district until their final two years of high school. Then they'd go back to their home districts and be ambassadors of what they had seen here. And while that's a terrific opportunity, what brought those students here as 6th, 7th, and 8th graders and caused them to want to stay here as 9th and 10th graders, if 11 and 12 were available, they were going to stay here and matriculate through evening schools and not return to member districts. Um, as I said, uh, the task force brought to the board a recommendation to increase uh, 11th and 12th grade class offerings. The board did not act on that. There, weren't, there were insufficient votes to approve that. Um, and, and that caused a period of time where EMID families now again had to reconsider their choices. If we can't have our students in crosswinds till the end of their high school career, when do we make the transition? Is the transition correct at 11th grade? Is the transition better made at 9th grade? Lots of factors come into that, including uh, what school you'll find and what is uh, uh, their alignment between mid school, middle school, and, and high school. Um, it was certainly disconcerting uh, to see uh, what transpired uh, in 2011 and 2012 when funding of the East Metro programs really became uh, an important element. Uh, it strikes all of us, I think, uh, to be ludicrous that we would be operating magnet schools, which clearly these two schools are magnet schools, but we would be absolutely opposed to funding them at a, a level equal to or greater than some of the men, uh, member districts' uh, average daily uh, tuition rate. And the uh, budgets were cut substantially, and on a per pupil basis, the funding to EMID schools was less than the funding to any student in any of the member districts. And we're expected to run a magnet program in that fashion. Um, it, it defies some logic. Um, I'm certainly available and willing to uh, answer any questions, but don't uh, wish to do so at the or don't want to continue uh, at the risk of, of overstaying my time. So um, I will yield and I'm certainly available for questions. Very well, thank you. Uh, members, uh, we are scheduled to finish at 2. Um, but we were forewarned that there's a 215 fire alarm which um, has, had been scheduled, but apparently that's been scheduled because nature is going to give us its own fire alarm, apparently, perhaps around that same time. So what I want to propose is we have another 11 minutes left of this hearing. I want to check in at that 2 o'clock 
uh, time, uh, finish the testimony before us, and then I want to see where members are at, because what I want to do is propose that we go for another 10, maybe 15 minutes, but no more than 2.15, because I do want to honor the, the fact that some of you are, are needing to get some, to some other places, and we've already had two other members who had uh, other commitments. So I will check in at 2 and see where we're all at. Um, who's next here? Oh, I'm sorry, Representative Fisher. Uh, question. I'll wait with question. Okay, all right, very well. Okay. All right, Ms. Thompson. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Mariani and committee members. Uh, I am the business manager for the East Metro Integration District. I've been with the district for 10 years. Um, as the business manager, I'm going to resist the impulse to share too many numbers, uh, but I would like to just touch on a few things uh, that also align with some of the historical uh, guideline and the uh, involvement of EMID. Um, first of all, uh, thanks to your continued support of integration revenue, um, our combined 10 member districts will generate about 27 or generate about $27 million in integration revenue uh, if you look at all of the districts within the collaborative. And this is just a quick overview. Um, the money does flow to the member districts, and in turn, they forward some of those integration dollars to us. Uh, you've heard much about the schools. In addition to the schools, we provide other member services or services to um, to our school districts, uh, to our families there. Currently, um, in fiscal year, well, the year that we just finished, fiscal year 13, uh, EMID received about $2.2 million in integration uh, of that $27 million. Uh, about $2 million went to programming for student programming, um, professional development, um, leadership, uh, and about $215,000 of that, or about 10%, was then spent um, on administration, the administration of the programs. Uh, I want to touch quickly on the historical changes that have happened from a financial perspective at EMID. Uh, back in 2003, I start with 2003 because that's when I started, so I guess I didn't think anything before that was important. Um, EMID was receiving $46 per pupil from each of it, from its member districts, $46 for each pupil that, are just, that the member districts served. So not $46 you know, for students that opted for our schools, but $46 for each um, AMCPU uh, in, in our member districts. Uh, so we generated about $3.6 million annually in integration revenue. Um, in July, uh, in, in 2007, 2008, there were some discussions uh, because we were seeing, or our districts were seeing, their change in demographics and increased needs. Also, a decline in enrollment. Um, state funding wasn't keeping up as far as the formula. So, again, just the, that drain that everyone felt on their resources. Uh, so, at that time, our board opted. Uh, we were funding our schools with the traditional backpack money, per se, but also included in that backpack money uh, were operating levy dollars that those students generated in their home districts. Those dollars used to follow those kids to our schools in the form of tuition. Um, so in looking at trying to balance the needs of the member districts, what was generated locally, there was some discussion and agreement that, um, uh, that those levy dollars would stay home in the resident district. They wouldn't follow the student. They were local property tax dollars. They would stay with the student, but at that time uh, it was determined that we would increase the amount of integration revenue that would come to the collaborative um, from you know $46 to $52 per pupil unit. So it really kind of offset that $800,000 gap that we would be losing in, um, in funding for our schools with the loss of the operating levy. So um, uh, the, the board did uh, make a decision um, to help offset that increase in recognizing um, that we would continue the operation of, of the magnet schools. Uh, part of that was in discussion with um, North St. Paul looking to better serve their own needs. Uh, the change was made in July first of 2008, um, North St. Paul opted to leave the collaborative a year later on July 1st of 2009. 
At that same time, Spring Lake Park uh, became a member of our collaborative. The net result there was a loss of about $400,000 in integration revenue. One year later, Matamidi left and joined North St. Paul in their collaborative. At that same time, we had Forest Lake join our collaborative. Um, so the offset there um, actually balanced out the, the loss the year before of about $400,000. Fast forward um, to July 1st of uh, 2012, and um, our board took action to reduce the amount of 50, from $52 per, per, per pupil unit to $30 per pupil unit. Again, looking at changing in demographics um, within their member districts and just the demands that, um, that were being placed uh, as far as serving uh, their own district population. Uh, so those, that was reduced to $30. It was further decided um, that the integration dollars uh, would no longer be used to support our magnet schools and, and support the 800 students in the magnet schools, but rather to focus on the 115,000 students throughout the collaborative. So um, we did make a deliberate shift at that time. Um, as I mentioned, um, looking at the funding of the schools, um, it's basically the backpack dollars. Uh, the student, the funds are generated by attendance at our schools. However, those dollars flow through the resident school districts. Uh, special ed dollars do flow directly to EMID, and we also receive some federal title dollars. So, on average, um, we're receiving about fifty-four hundred dollars um, per student. Uh, we saw a loss at this time in the change of, change of the funding of about $1.6 million um, in our school operations. Uh, so basically, why did, uh, why did we decide to close the schools? Um, uh, we have the funding challenges. Uh, the board had made the determination. Uh, we, you know, some of our challenges are we don't have that local levy. Um, we have had challenges with enrollment at our secondary grade levels. Much of that um, can be attributed to some of the uncertainty, some of the uncertainty with integration revenue, the uncertainty about the continuation of the program. Um, those obviously led uh, to um, some of our decreases in enrollment. Also the fact that we are choice schools. There is not a family that has, doesn't have to take an extra step to come to our schools. We rely heavily on our members um, to share information about our schools. Um, and, and given uh, the challenges that we've had in the last couple of years, um, we, we haven't been able to accomplish that, uh, which brought us or gave us concern about sustainability into the future. Members were uh, three minutes to two o'clock. We still have uh, Superintendent Moore uh, to hear from. I think it's going to take more. It should, it should take more than three minutes. Oh, I'll keep it so, short. So, but, but I do. I, I, I want to be fair. Are we okay staying for another ten minutes, uh, twelve minutes? So we'll say, you know what? Let me just say two fifteen. Will that work? That's good. Okay, wonderful. Then let's. Uh, uh, we'll set a hard stop at two fifteen, uh, Superintendent. Okay. I certainly won't be talking for that long, but um, I will keep it short. But first of all, um, Chair Mariani and uh, members of the legislature and your staff, I appreciate you so much coming today and to um, have this forum to talk about um, integration, not only integration on the East Metro, even though that is what it was our, um, the intended purpose. But I think we need to really take a look at the entire state of Minnesota. Um, and I thank all of you so very much for your support of integration revenue that impacted the entire state of Minnesota, not just the metro area. And I say that because I'm a greater Minnesota superintendent who happened to land in the Twin Cities a few years ago as a superintendent here. Um, studies that I did back in the 70s, primarily because I uh, was a psychologist and an administrator close to the White Earth Indian Reservation, um, lived in Detroit Lakes, Minnesota, um, did a phenomenal study about the graduation rate and how um, 
um, terrible it was in relationship to our um, white population of students. How our students came from the reservation as eighth graders and then quickly dropped out when they became ninth graders or tenth graders. Why? Because they weren't understood. People didn't understand how to operate um, with students from the, from the reservation who learned differently. Their frame of reference was different. And I think with uh, working so closely with 34 superintendents in the Northwest Minnesota, we all realized the same thing, that our populations were changing, they, the diversity was, was greater, but our success rate for many of those students uh, were pale in relationship to our white students. Uh, when I came to the Twin Cities, I um, saw, I was first uh, de redesigning a mental health program at Intermediate School District 916 and saw <coughs> multiple African American males walking the halls of a few of our schools who were really, it was clear that they were misunderstood er, way earlier than when they ended in a special four, a level four federal setting for a special education program. It was an honor to come to the East Metro Integration District as a superintendent. Um, I was uh, uh, impressed by the integration that I did see at Crosswinds and Arumba. It was different than what I had seen in other places where I had been, even though from Duluth, Minnesota to Detroit Lakes, like I said, for 40 years being in more greater Minnesota areas and in the metro area. Um, there was isolation. Students sat at different lunch tables. The playground was different, but not had a rum band crosswinds. It was much different because they did integrated. They were integrated not only in the classroom, but they were integrated in their um, free time, their unstructured time. Um, a model from which so many of us could learn from in our other school districts. Um, but. What I really want to say is not so much that, it's first of all, thank you for the integration revenue, but second of all, EMID isn't going away. But I think EMID has a lot to learn. Having been the superintendent for a little over a year, um, we have seen a, a distraction by the conversations that we've had about the schools. The funding of the schools, the purpose of the schools, the value of the schools as it, as it has been articulated in many different ways uh, by our member districts. Um, and certainly everyone is strapped for money. So categorical aid, such as integration funding, is very important to our member districts, which becomes a very important part of they becoming a part of an integration district. Um, but it's more than that. Um, we're, we're when I have been working this past year with our cultural liaisons, our integration specialists, our curriculum and instruction leaders, and our superintendents, we're finding that we pale um, in one area, and maybe more than one area, but that's what we've concentrated on is cultural competency. And where do we begin to have the tools that are in everyone's toolbox to, to systemically change our environments to be um, environments that understand the rich assets that we have by the diverse populations of students that we serve. We have a lot to learn in the East Metro. I can't speak so much about the Northwest Metro or the, uh, or the uh, or West uh, WEMAP, but I can certainly speak to the um, East Metro in that we need to begin to develop our new normal. Our new normal is now we are not, no longer talking about the schools because the schools have been repurposed to other owners and other entities, or will be, on uh, January, or excuse me, on July 10th, which is tomorrow. Um, our school board will decide whether or not Perfect Center for the Arts and EMID will enter into an, um, a contract for operation and management services, which is called an income contract with the state of Minnesota, to um, have Perpich um, manage and operate Crosswinds school facility for the 13-14 school year. Um, should that fail, then Crosswinds will uh, 
for a lack of a better term right now, be mothballed. We will pay about $400,000 to um, have the school maintained uh, with custodians, heat and lights, and we'll have our member services department officed out of crosswinds. Our member services department, which is addresses programs and services to the 100,000 students in our 10 member districts, includes professional development, which involves uh, anywhere from state, um, uh, state specialists on um, integration, equity, early childhood, family engagement, uh, career and college readiness to national uh, level organizations who um, have experiences and expertise in this area, such as the Nat National Urban Alliance, um, Beyond Diversity, uh, which has also been um, a um, nationwide uh, program that some of our school districts have engaged in. So we'll continue with the professional development. We'll continue with youth services. That's 80% of the revenue that needs to be spent on student contact. Um, and that will be provided through after school programming, Saturday programs, holiday programs, when school isn't in session, basically, including Saturdays. Um, engaging in programs that would be tied to academic standards. Um, we would also have um, students engaged in activities that our metropolitan area assets provide us, such as the Science Museum um, and other programs like into that. So, um, having said that, um, we also need to create a new normal about what does the statute mean for every one of our school districts. The statute is heavily embeds closing the achievement gap. And from what I heard spoken of at hearings was that was a very serious and intentional component of the integration statute. That we need to hold ourselves accountable for how we are moving the dial towards better outcomes, higher graduation rates, better outcomes in reading and math at third grade, and other grades as um, students move through our systems and attaining those benchmarks. Um, so when I say we have to create our new normal, um, it is. It's, it's almost as if I don't want to say we're starting over, but I am saying that we need to rede redefine who we are as an integration district. And possibly because all of our districts have changed in demographics, they have um, they have also had a lot of tremendous work done already in many of our districts with um, cultural competency, um, equity, um, and uh, Roseville is one that's a standout. They are an isolated district, but they stand out um, as being one who's been very intentional on equity work within their district, and you can feel it and sense it in their culture. And there are other districts that are doing tremendous work as well. But now as a collaborative, we need to look at how we're going to collectively be more cost efficient and effective with the dollars that we have um, in order to provide the programs and the services that we can and use best practices across districts lines in order to embed what's working in some districts and share that with other districts. So we have a, we've, we've learned a lot from the discussions that we've had, and we will learn more as we move forward. Um, but um, we need to be more intentional about looking at the statute and what does that mean for each and every one of us, and how in two years, when we meet with the legislature again, when we're looking at those dollars again and advocating for them, what have we done with what we've had? Um, so I thank you very much for the opportunities you've provided us. I thank you very much for um, you being here today. I'm very sorry for the chaos that we caused um, during the legislative session um, due to a lot of discussions about the schools for, uh, for not having a real um, well and clear message. Um, but we've learned. And we will um, also uh, be better at providing you with the information that you need to provide in the years to come. So thank you very much. Thank you, Superintendent. And uh, of course, uh, uh, it would be remiss for me to say that uh, I've been in the legislature for many years, and, and typically if there's chaos, we, we also have a hand in it uh, ourselves as legislators. 
Uh, I was going to ask a question, but I won't. I just want to make a very quick, quick observation. One, thank you for lifting up, uh, looking forward, the importance of collaborative work and understanding what that really means. And, and uh, uh, I want to thank you, um, Mr. Haggerty and Ms. Thompson. You know, basically what I heard was that there were a number of financial decisions that were made. We could pass judgment on them one way or the other, but those decisions basically put uh, these schools in a place where they could not be financially run anymore. And yet, we heard from the very beginning from our staff that decisions about these, uh, uh, one, these facilities, because they're state facilities, and two, arguably, you know, is state policy, that um, we really shouldn't be backing ourselves into making those kind of decisions based on financial decisions alone. That there should be a finding that, uh, that the program and the buildings are no longer needed for the purpose for which they were constructed. And so for me, I think as a legislator, one of the things that I'll continue to have this conversation in going into the, uh, throughout the interim and into the next year, is how do we get it right in terms of making the kinds of decisions we need to make, not by default, as understandable as they may be, but being very conscious and very straightforward about those decisions based on, on our judgment of policy, and that could be a shared responsibility, absolutely, between the state and, and school districts, but that, but that whatever happens to these kind of learning environments and these kind of experiments should really never be done simply because of financial decisions, even though those are part of, 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 of reality. So where's the evaluative, evaluation work, et cetera? So uh, we have three minutes, four minutes. Representative Fisher, I think, has a quick question or comment. And who knows, we might even get to Representative Brighton and Representative Isaac, so you never know. Thank you, Mr. Chair, committee. I appreciate the opportunity to be part of this com uh, committee meeting today. A um, uh, couple of things I want to mention is, first of all, as was called up before, is Roseville has done a great job over the years on this. I was honored to have my kids as part of this the collaborative when it first opened up. I was originally a citizen representative for the board. And I, I think one of the things is going forward is what are good in the models, if you're looking at models going forward, if you would have had more citizens acting as a citizen rep, is I think sometimes what happens is you start making the dollar decisions, they start entering in, and it's kind of what we experience in the nonprofit world that I'm in, is that sometimes you start chasing around what's more important, the dollar or taking care of the mission. And that's a difficult position. If you don't have people who are part of the players, as part of that discussion, you start losing that. And I think that's one of the things that you have to keep in mind. You're, you're in the same situation as we are in the nonprofit world. So that would be great to keep in there. And I, I think one of the other things that's very important is the fact that from what I'm hearing, we still need integration, intentional integration going forward. So if the programs aren't being run by EMED and this building were to be mothballed, I think it's very important that another organization come in to continue those efforts because as was stated in the original method uh, message, is that this is what this building was purposed for and needs to continue. And I think it's very intentional that we do these type of things. Uh, having gone from a unique position from being in my mid-50s and going from a white, male-dominated society to working to a nonprofit where I work with homeless youth, males and females who are predominantly African-American, uh, the culture is much different and how you interact is things I had to unlearn to be able to effectively work in that method is in that environment was very important to be able to hear what was actually going on and be able to help make connections so that these youth could eventually be successful down the road. And I think this is where voluntary integration really helps in these methods is to give us the tools to be able to, for our kids to have these same tools so that I'm not, when I went in, I had to learn things to make sure that I could be effective. And I think this is where this kind of work is very important. I would encourage that these kind of programs, intentional integration continue. And if we've got two schools only on the East Metro area, even though they're being run by others, I think we need to take a look at having more schools that are being run by this. And I guess the question that I have coming in that I heard eventually early on is that $27 million of integration monies come from the, from the state to the school districts. Do the school districts get those only because they're part of the East Metro Integration District, or do they, as I'm seeing, yes, that they get it only because they're part of it? Which raises the question I raised earlier, or the point about it, and I know not all school districts are, are like this, but I do feel that maybe some of them are more looking at chasing the dollars that come with it than the intentional program that goes along. And that's why I kind of felt in some of the issues that I was dealing with while trying to have advocate for the schools for these programs at the legislature. Representative Ryder. 
Well, thank you, Chair Mariani. And I can't possibly say all the thoughts that are on my mind in the next uh, 90, 90 seconds. seconds that I might be allotted here. 30. So um, I really want to thank everyone for being here because um, I feel like a lot of issues have been exposed in a new and unique way, even though the issues have been before us before, the threads that have been created between the data that we started with, the, the experiences of students and parents in these schools, uh, the more executive perspective on how the work that's done here connects to the work of our, our other schools, our more, you know, our school districts, and how we really begin to translate. And to me, this has been an issue that many of us have faced for decades. How do we translate successful, isolated experiences, whether, whether they're about uh, intentional integration or continuous progress models or ungraded school environments. How do we translate those uh, to the broader community and bring best practices as, more effectively, as the superintendent mentioned, to our traditional environments? I think that's a question for all of us. And the, the issue was raised by a parent earlier about uh, advocating for policies that support you know, intentional integration or any other out-of-the-box thinking. What are those policies? I would, and I'm not expecting anybody to answer that today, but I think that's the provocative question. How do we create policy at the state level that isn't um, overly uh, micromanaging, over, you know, governing to a degree where we uh, uh, actually um, stifle creativity and incentives and in districts to solve problems in unique ways? and yet model what we know has been successful around our state. So I think we all leave, I leave with challenges for more uh, thoughtful approaches to a whole range of policies, and I thank everyone for being here today. Well, so, so Isaacson, you get the last word. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to be really brief. The, the idea that what you guys have presented today has been very helpful for me to understand the process that this came about, and I can see, as I have found in many of the problems we have in our government today, it starts with, I think, poor legislative activity in the previous years, and I think that's what needs to be fixed. Uh, I understand why some of the legislative activity occurred because of the way our budget was at the time, but putting you guys in a position where there wasn't a decision that was a winning decision and not being having a legislature that could possibly respond in a positive way. So as I think in some ways our legislature has created this problem, I can see now legislatively next session, regardless of how that board votes tomorrow, we're going to fix this problem. And so I think that's part of what my goal is. But I, I certainly hope the board uh, makes the right choice in that situation. But either way, I think in the next session, we're going to see some legislation that retools and, and provides for uh, better financial support for integration. Thank you. Well said. And, and you know, like most things in, good, in public policy, these are shared responsibilities. These are not just responsibilities of this school or of this integration uh, uh, collaborative, but also of, of us as a state. Uh, both the executive and legislative branch. So I do hope, I do uh, intend to continue to vet this issue out in the coming months along with some other issues and into the uh, uh, interim, or rather into the next session. And I hope to be able to, to uh, count on your constant interaction with us in a very transparent and, and, and public way. I want to thank you all for the time. Um, uh, you've given your time, you've given your best thoughts. You've, uh, some of you have poured out your heart. In your soul as well, I want to uh, uh, express my deep appreciation uh, for that. I want to thank the young people in particular and the parents uh, for being here. Um, and members, uh, please look uh, uh, for work uh, for me. Uh, I had done a bit of, of vetting with, with the members toward the end of the session, and I apologize for not getting back to you in terms of what your interest would be in the interim. Um, so I hope to do that very soon. And um, uh, we'll come up with a intelligent, doable uh, schedule for interim oversight meetings uh, in the fall. So look for that for me. Thank you, each and every one of you, uh, especially those of you who have driven quite a distance to be here. I uh, greatly appreciate it. I don't think our statewide legislators are often as appreciated as they should be, given the, the big sacrifices that many of you do in terms of moving um, large distances uh, and moving yourself and family uh, to be here to attend to the people's work. So thank you very much, members. Thank, uh, thank you. I hope you all stay dry. Whatever um, you know precluded that uh, fire alarm, I hope it's not uh, for that drill. I hope that it's, it doesn't become a problem for us on our way home. So with that, uh, members, this committee stands adjourned.